Good evening and welcome to the Council Advisory Committee CAC meeting of the 9th of May 2022. This meeting is being held in chambers and it is requested that members wear their mask unless speaking. Citizens must wear their mask at all times while in the chamber. The meeting is being live streamed on Facebook Live and the most up-to-date meeting package is on the Town of Kentville website. This meeting is called to order. Have all of the councillors received and reviewed their meeting package? Does any member of council have information pertaining to a matter before this council which has not been publicly circulated? As the Council Advisory Committee, CAC, we will vote as a committee to either send business forward to the council meeting for ratification, return to staff for further information or review, or defeat the recommendation. I will remind members of council that we should continue to be mindful of our decision-making wheel to make balanced and respectful decisions while adhering to our code of conduct. This council through policy and at our has adopted Robert's rules as our rules of order, our parliamentary procedure, and as the chair of the meeting, it is my responsibility to use those orders to ensure we get the business of the town done. We will be voting electronically on all motions except administrative, which will be by show of hands. Are there any conflict of interest issues we should be aware of before the meeting commences? I note that all members of council are present and we have quorum. We have been provided with a proposed agenda. Are there any further additions to the agenda? I have uh, one addition to item 10 in camera. It will be 10B personnel CAO appraisal. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Huntley, thank you. All those in favour? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. The minutes of the April 11th, 2022 CAC meeting have been distributed for approval. If there are no changes, the minutes are approved as distributed. If there are changes, the recording sec secretary will annotate the minutes. Are there any changes? I see no hands. All right, we'll move on. We have no presentations this evening, so that moves us directly into our department reports and recommendations. The directors have provided their reports for your review and will provide an update and receive questions from council, and you may ask the director directly your questions. And the reports will be presented, are part of the record of this meeting, and will not be taken for motion. Only items of new business arising from the reports will be taken for motion. CAO Trope, could you please introduce our department reports and recommendations? Uh, thank you, Mayor Snow. So tonight, as we normally would, we'll be starting tonight with Director Kroll with our finance updates. Thank you very much and good evening to everybody. It's my pleasure to bring you the report for the, the very first report for this fiscal year, April 30th, 2022. Um, under the summary, just for council's information and the public who's listening, um, we, have, uh, we have sent out the interim tax bills and the due date for those interim tax bills is May 31st. I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, we also passed, as we are here today to talk about April 30, 2022, we've passed the operating budget for this fiscal year and the capital investment plan uh, at the council meeting on April 25th. And the Water Commission met on April the 27th and ratified both its, uh, both its operating and capital investment plan. And I just wanted to let the public know that these budgets are up on the website for people to look at if they so choose. So turning our eyes to the town of Kentville for the month of April, we're looking at a benchmark of 8.33% if everything was averaged evenly over the year. Uh, revenue overall exceeds the average at 34.6%. Taxes, of course, was issued, as I mentioned a few moments ago, and it's reporting at 46% recorded. Under services to other governments, one half of the library funding has been forwarded to the municipality of Kings. Under sales of services, we have the sales of services by Kensal Police Service, lo the local sales are recorded at this time. And, uh, the, and under other revenue owned sources, the parking space rentals are recorded as uh, at, at, at August, I was gonna say August, mm. April 30th. <laughs> I'm wishing for summer, I guess. <laughs> On the expenditure side of the ledger, we're looking at a benchmark of 8% expended. General administration exceeds it 
uh, this percentage because the general insurance premium was paid from that particular department and it will be reallocated once the reallocations come in from the insurance company. So you'll see that spread out all through the whole um, town operating budget plus the water and the sanitary sewer. Under the police corps program, it exceeds the guideline as the first quarter payment was made for the answering service and transportation services has paid 25% of the public transit to King's Transit Authority. And under recreation, we have the first quarterly payment made to the Annapolis Valley Regional Library. So that's about all that's happened in the uh, operating fund. We don't have a tax report per se because the taxes aren't due until May 31st, but I will tell you that the interim tax billing was about $5 million, 4.997 million, and last year it was 4.88 million. Property tax outstanding at April 30th was about $4.7 million. And we'll of course provide you better information or more information on statistics once the due date has passed. The Sanitary Sewer Area Service, which is Schedule D, is reporting for the year ended March 31st, 2022. And of course, the percentage would be 100% if everything was averaged evenly over the year. The revenue is above the target at 102.3%. Sewer charges are slightly under the budget at 98.8%. Uh, interest charges fell short on the budget, 69.3%. And permits exceeded the budget by $1,975. There was also some miscellaneous revenue, which was not budgeted which fell out of the finalization of the arbitration process. On the expenditure side of the sanitary sewer ledger, we are looking at it basically being at budget at 100.3% expended. Administration expenditures exceeded the budget, reporting at 106.2%. And this was related to legal expenditures uh, due to the finalization of the arbitration process. Uh, the domestic sewer maintenance section and the pumping station segments, they all both fell under the budget due to lower maintenance in this infrastructure. And at the date of writing, uh, the sanitary sewer was posting a current surplus of $27,723. And I gave some text there that we're not final, but we are now. So I can tell you that surpluses are. Actually, I'll tell you for the town operating fund, we're looking at a surplus position of $154,300. Uh, and dollars and 41 cents, so that is good news. Sanitary sewer uh, surplus, $24,816.96. And the Kentville Water Commission ended the year with a surplus of $8,884, and its budget was 10500 So all, all in, all funds had a surplus posi position at the end of the year. The Perpetual Investment Fund, which are Schedules E and F, were reporting for the year ended March 31st, 2022. And at the bottom of page three, you can see the breakdown between cost and market and our, our instruments that we're invested in. At March the 31st, interest paid into the fund was $137,421. Dividends paid into the fund totaled $231,352. And capital losses were $14,121. At March 31st, management fees totaled $37,409, and this compares to last year's figures of $35,391. The annual withdrawal was arrived on March the 23rd, 2022, for $460,000, and it was deposited to the Town of Kentville Operating Fund as per legislation. We're looking at the capital investment plan, which are schedules G, and this is the this is the very first report on this, and there's not much happening. Right now we bought a police car. $69,592, or 1.5% of that budget has been expended, but you'll see that change month by month, and you'll, we'll be bringing that to you every month. So that is my report from the Finance Department for the month ended April 30, 2022. Thank you very much, uh, Director Kroll. Are there any questions for the Director on this report? Councillor Maxwell, please. Thank you, Director, for that report. And my I'll call it lack of financial background here a little bit. Um, we put a new uh, management team in place, I think, for the perpetual investment fund. And I'm looking at losses here and higher management fees and um, less less interest. Is uh, is this? What we did, is that accomplishing anything here? Like, <laughs> I'm just wondering, it just doesn't look like a very rosy picture. 
Um, well, the management fees are tied to a percentage of the total amount of the fund. So the more that the fund is, the larger the fund right. is, the more the fees would be. Okay. So that's one reason why those fees, that's the reason why those fees are a little higher. We are over $14 million, $14.5 million uh, with that fund. Uh, the losses and whatnot come from just bonds being retired, and when they were retired, they, they are, there actually was a small loss in a couple of bonds that were that were bought probably 10 years ago. Okay. So that's kind of the normal course of uh, business uh, in, in the investment world. So it's okay. nothing to be alarmed about. There was nothing, I think the town did very well uh, in a very difficult climate. Okay. So we aren't unhappy with our rate of return. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I won't. I, I won't direct it, this to uh, Director Kroll or to Councillor Maxwell, but I'll just speak to the chair with respect to the um, uh, um, investment fund. Um, we actually stayed with the same investment manager um, for the for an additional year, um, and the reason why we did was because we had our investment policy statement other under review by um, the province, which was um, which has been now signed off. So that request uh, for proposal uh, will be going out again. I believe it's in September of this in year. Fall. In the mm -hmm. fall, yeah. Um, so, uh, it, so it wasn't, we didn't put anybody new in. We actually just extended our um, existing investment advisor for the ensuing year. So that might provide some clarification. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor and you. Chair of the Investment Committee. Are there any qu other questions uh, for Director Kroll? No other questions? Thank you very much, Director. Thank you very much. And now moving on to our Planning Department. Good evening, thank you. Um, so for the month of April, we issued 24 permits with a building valuation of $3.6 million. And um, we have now have a total of uh, $14.3 million and construction season is only just starting. To, just starting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the municipal flood line mapping project, uh, staff had their first meeting with the committee. Um, to create a set of standards that will apply across the province, creating consistency um, in how flood line mapping is carried out. So we met with the county and the province, so we're now in the process of just trying to put together the uh, request for proposal to send that out. Um, we do have three uh, consulting companies who have already showed interest in the province. Uh, we just have to set up a, an RFP for, for our procurement process to carry that through. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Hobu Court development is moving along nicely. They're on their second building and, um, and they're prepping for the third. Um, later on, we'll talk about a little bit about a potential heritage bylaw. We'll, um, council has provided just an overview of some of the issues and pros and cons of the heritage bylaw. And staff are still working with a number of groups of people for rezoning applications um, all over the place. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> some um, applications have not been submitted. There's uh, quite a bit of information that we're looking for from some bodies to, to, to move ahead with that. But um, things are getting are quite busy. So that's my report. Excellent. Thank you very much. Director, are there any questions uh, for uh, Director Gentleman? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Director Gentleman, have we heard sort of what the time frame is on the other buildings that are going up um, uh, on School Street there around Ryan's Park? The other, whatever no, it was, I think it was 60 units maybe? The Goshen part of it? No, they were um, in touch uh, a couple of months ago and said that they were hoping to get some plans together, okay. but we haven't seen anything. And hopefully we'll see something within the next couple of months on the uh, River Street project as well. Okay, great, thank you. Councillor Sabian. Thank you, thank you, Director Gentleman. Um, just, yeah, those um, Goshen properties up there on School Street, was there a uh, timeline on that to when it was supposed to start or when it was supposed to have the footings in on the 60 units? 
or is it tied into the original? The number of units that they were supposed to have started right. have been met. Okay. But on, this, on the other ones that... It was the overall project. Okay. Right. okay. So what's there now meets is, the, the percentage okay. of what needs to be done. Perfect. They're thank a little you. behind in completing it, but council's already given them a, okay. an extension on that. All right. Thank you. Are there any... Did you need to... No, I... I okay. Okay. Um, so I just, uh, I, I want to draw everyone's attention to, uh, to your, your report, your activity report, uh, Bev, because I think that this really speaks to what is happening in Kenfield. And if we look at the April 2021 year total, it was 51. Here we are at April of 2022, and our year total is already at 46. So uh, we are going to smoke last year's stats uh, yep. out of the water. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is absolutely incredible, and, uh, and just thank you to you and your staff for, uh, for the great work in, in getting this stuff uh, off your desks and, uh, and into reality in the town of Kenfield. So thank, thank you, you for that. And there are no more questions for okay. you. Thank you. All right, our next one is the Community Economic Development Coordinator. You have been provided with that. Uh, CAO Trope, was there anything that you wanted to uh, highlight? I see some highlights there. Can do. Uh, so thank you very much, Mayor. Um, so just wanted to let folks know that the uh, staff hiring for the Visitor Information Center is completed uh, logistics around the coordinating and the planning for Apple Blossom Festival is, is ongoing. So we've had meetings with the committee. The committee is providing documentation to the town so we can have a formal structured agreement uh, with the committee to make sure that we've got all the resources in place to kind of kickstart uh, Apple Blossom. Uh, the uh, Black Women of Excellence business pop-up event for Center Square is confirmed for Apple Blossom Saturday, May 28th. So folks may want to put that in as an opportunity to drop over and, and meet some folks. Um, and the Brian Gibson mur mural ceremony is happening during festival week on Friday, May 27th. So uh, again, over in the public garden space, that mural is going to be, um, uh, the ceremony is going to be happening. So I just want to make sure that those were dates. I know that uh, Lindsay does a great job of keeping everybody in the loop as to what's going on and when, but um, these were some pieces in our report. I wanted to make sure we highlight them. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, CAO. Were there any questions uh, to the CAO on this report? None. All right. Moving right along to Director Bettingfield on uh, Parks and Recreation. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, just a few things to highlight in my report. Um, just to note that we have, it says here that there's six staff, there's probably five and a half because we have our maintenance staff included in who's downtown or all around our parks operating our, our park stuff right now. So to be patient, but they're getting to all of the places, um, including cleanup and, and starting to mow and all those great things. Um, unfortunately, uh, we have found the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid at the Gorge. We had an event two weekends ago, and it was discovered. Um, we had about 50 volunteers show up over the course of the two sessions, um, and we did find the invasive species. So um, that's very unfortunate, um, but the committee is, is um, getting back together to figure out how to move forward. You will see information coming out about um, promoting the fundraising campaigns. Um, and I will continue to bring uh, things, information to council as we progress. Um, we have um, hired all of our staff for the summer, um, short a lifeguard. If anybody around here has a lifeguard certification that they'd like to jump out, that would be great. <laughs> um, in the meantime, we've uh, um, uh, solidified two grants, one of, one of which covers uh, in full our new position this summer, our junior summer intern, which is really quite exciting. This is an opportunity for someone who's really enthusiastic um, in high school who is looking forward to maybe coming into this field one day and we're showing them behind the scenes um, and Riley Lake was a successful candidate so you'll be seeing Riley out in the community this summer she's really focused on youth and youth engagement 
um, and, and offering those programs. And um, she's also interested in policy development. <laughs> Who knew not what I was going to do in grade 10, but Riley's <laughs> quite keen. So welcome, Riley. Um, our department also received money uh, from the, um, from the uh, Federal Summer Jobs Grant, and that will help us with our revenue targets as we move forward and also keep costs down this summer, so we're quite excited. Uh, summer camp registration opened on May 2nd and closed May 2nd. It was the fastest people have registered for camp um, since I've been here. Uh, I guess we're back full force, so that's exciting. 320 spots were filled quite quickly. Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg with regards to what we have for folks this summer. So um, just to let everybody know to keep their eyes open. Um, we have staff that are working on reinstating the community gardens as part of a food security initiative that we're working on. And we partner quite closely with Valley Community Learning Association on that. Nice. They've been doing a lot of work at their, at their space, which is located on Oak Dean as well. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that as things progress. Uh, we held a community consultation piece the other week and received some feedback and, and we'll be moving forward from there. Uh, the Kenfield Home Show was welcomed back after a two year hiatus. Um, it, 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 we partnered this year with Darwin Event Group to help us run it. This is, for those folks that don't know, is a major uh, fundraiser, so to speak, or revenue source for the Kenfield Arena for us to help keep costs low there. So. Um, we don't have the finals yet, uh, numbers back yet on that event, but we're certainly excited to have had it back on the books. Uh, just from a capital <coughs> excuse me, perspective, I know the splash pad is top of mind. Thanks to Public Works for helping us navigate that piece. Um, we're, we've got a plan and we're going to move forward on it and we're still on target to open for this season. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, um, one thing to mention around council related pieces, I think this is really important. So um, within the planning department, Kirsten was able to finally com uh, complete her Rick Hansen certification okay. course, which is a big deal for our community. I had, I had it on my notes here and I left it in there. I don't know you're going to this, but you actually have to finish it. She's, she's finished it is a huge deal and we're so excited to have someone with that skill set. It's not an easy certification at all. Um, but we know there wasn't any doubt in anybody's mind that Kirsten would be the smartest one out of all of us to be able to do it. So we're really happy for that. Glad it wasn't me. Um, uh, from an AT perspective, um, the province has reached out and asked to take some before and after pictures. So they were here last week and gave them a tour of some of the larger projects that we're going to be talking about next. Um, so that we have kind of that what it looked like before and what it looked like after and how it impacted our community So we're part of there. I think they have three sites in the province that they're doing that with um, I also learned that the province has two official photographers like the Obama administration who knew <laughs> um, And then for the regional recreation complex the committee met on April 12th to discuss the draft document uh, We're hoping to receive the final completed feasibility study by the end of May and then there'll be a follow-up meeting with that committee in June. So we'll continue to keep folks updated for that. And that's my report. Excellent. Thank you very much. And are there any questions for Director Benningfield with regards uh, to this report? Councillor Maxwell. And I think Councillor Maxwell is going to volunteer for that uh, lifeguard. lifeguard position. Just when you look at you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just as soon as the uh, Red Cross or Water Safety Society comes up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, little course for seniors. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> definitely we'll do that. Um, no, I, uh, I feel like I, <laughs> okay. I feel like getting up on the table and dancing because we're going to get our splash pad open and so thank you so much to Public Works and, and Recreation. I know that that's huge for the community and uh, so yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just uh, always like to um, praise people when I can praise people. So um, Len Wegg, who one of the photographers, yeah. he is one. Yes. Of, he's my neighbor in Perth, yes. bro. and uh, he mentioned to me the next day. He said the interview that he did with you and the photos that he did with you. He was absolutely impressed with the AT plan and uh, what what we're moving forward with here as as a town and and just how progressive we really are in the growth and. Uh, the, he was astounded by it, so, and was is equally impressed with you and your credentials. So, I was his first stop of the day. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> he was very impressed. <laughs> so, thank you for that. Yeah, we're excited to be a part of that initiative. Absolutely, it's going to be really neat. Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Huntley. 
Hi, Rachel. I just wanted to say congrats on the piece about all summer positions have been filled because if you watch on any social media, even in newspapers, everybody's having a challenge to hire summer help. So you've obviously done something right, uh, you and your team, so kudos to you. Yeah. Thanks for that. I, I think it's important yeah. to note <clears throat> that our summer hiring, and I've mentioned this before, is really part of our commitment to youth and youth development and yeah. professional development. Yeah. Um, so we are pretty clear about that as well, that it's not just a job, you're actually coming to gain skills and yep. include, like from the interview stage yep. on. Um, Absolutely. So we're pretty, we're pretty lucky that way. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And I have to say, not only have we filled our positions, but we're really excited about the people that we've hired. We have a okay. great team assembled for this summer, mm -hmm. which is great. Are there any further questions for Director Bettingfield? Rachel, did you want to take this opportunity to introduce Ahmad and uh, his report? I will. All right. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we've asked Ahmad uh, to, come, to come back to present, um, really because he's the one who's been doing the heavy lifting on this one. Um, so, so with the active transportation plan and the um, projects that are uh, that we'll be doing this year. We wanted to make sure that council was kept up to date with the details of those plans. So you've approved the budget and within that budget, we left it to the brilliant minds of Ahmad and they've probably helped a little bit. <laughs> 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 to figure out the details within each of those projects. So that's what he's gonna come up with. I think it's important to note that council knows that internally our senior management team meets regularly on things like the accessibility plan, but also the active transportation plan. So that it takes the lens of every single department. So as we're moving through with the projects, you know that it's crossed the eyes of traffic authority, you have safety uh, from a green space plan, um, everything all the way down the line. So it, it's kind of seen everybody's eyes and then Ahmad took that vision and that's what you're gonna, you're going to um, hear from today. I also, before I sit down, do want to formally thank Ahmad. I know he's moved on to, um, a position that works a bit better for him and we're sad to see him go but he worked his little tail off and thank you so much for everything you've done for the town of Tenfold and for my personal sanity. I just want to thank <laughs> If I could just ask everybody to make sure that, for example, Paula, can you make sure that your microphone is pointing toward you? It really helps with our closed captioning after the fact so that we don't miss any words. Um, Ahmad, if you can make sure your, your mic is really pointed at you so that no one misses anything you're saying. All right. Thank you very much. Sorry. Is this showing? Yeah, it is. Try the... No. Try the file manager. Okay. All right, we're good. Working. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good, ap good evening, everyone. Uh, so, I've worked on the active transportation plan with Dave and Rachel. This, is, this active transportation plan is a multi-use trail that's connecting the Harvest Moon Trail from east to west. And it's going to help with a lot of things. One of them is accessibility. Second thing is for cyclists. They can have a way to, that can, they can cycle through town and they can see all the business around town. and have an active lifestyle, I guess. And uh, here we go. So first I'm gonna be showing some existing conditions of how the downtown area is. And um, later on I'll be showing other, other, other projects that we will be, well, they will be doing. Uh, this is Justice Way, Station, Station Lane. And we have the Harvest Moon Trail over there. So we're gonna be connecting that. Uh, this is Station Lane. And this is Webster. So Webster Street, we had a hard time uh, trying to figure out how are we gonna put that active, the, how are we gonna put the multi-use trail on there. Uh, we've contacted uh, Nova Scotia Power, uh, trying to see because that road has a lot of electric poles on it and we cannot uh, we cannot move the move the electric poles because there's there's no room for them to be put and it's gonna cost more than 200 grand just to move them and it's gonna cost buying an easement which we can't because it's gonna be going through that through the property right there 
So we came out with a different idea, which is, you'll see it in, in the next slides. So this is um, a future parking lot that Bev was working on for probably months. <laughs> <laughs> so we got that approved. Um, this parking lot is gonna be containing 36 parking spots, I believe. And you can see there that we're, we're having the, I don't know if you can see it, yeah, you can. So this is, this is the multi-use trail. It's gonna be from asphalt all the way from Leverett Avenue to all the way to, Web, to Webster Street. So we have that. This is the parking lot area. All right, and we're going to here. Yeah, go ahead. So where is that exactly? And this is the future parking lot. Can you go back up a bit, the green? Maybe back up one more? Yeah. yeah. So, That's the grass at Kings County? Yes. The province gave us that. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry, oh, no thank problem. you. No problem. Okay. We're okay. also, um, what we've included also is like the tactile surface mats also for accessibility. And we have um, yeah, yeah, yeah. two colors t t to differentiate between if you're walking on the sidewalk or the multi-use trail and to not fall on the road. So we have the concrete curbs and the asphalt. So there's two colors there. Um, yeah. So here we come on Station Lane. Uh, we had some difficulties here, but I think we solved them in a way. So we had the bus stop, it was further down where you want to move it towards um, beside the Heritage Center. And then add a kiosk map, which has the, like, for example, the, the business center is down there, the museum, the town hall, and other, other parts in Campbell. And we're also gonna be putting a bike shelter also there, and some grass. Uh, we're gonna be re replacing the curb and gutter at that, that road right there um yeah that's it for this one this is a uh, like a small example of how it's going to look like with the bus stop the shelter and the map with the campo logo on it so this is station lane it's going to be all the way this is where it gets interesting <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we figured it out. We connected the, the, the multi-use trail to the road. We're gonna take one lane uh, out of Webster Street, just that small area, and we're gonna make two bike lanes on it, and we're gonna keep the sidewalk so we don't rip that out, lose money, and we can let the pedestrians walk on the sidewalk, and we can get the two cyclists, I mean the cyclists on the road with a buffer, that would let them cycle safely and we can have planters or concrete um, curbs that can be removed or can be placed there permanently. Uh, the planters will bring beautification to Campville, which is really nice. And it will connect there to the West, um, West Multi, I mean West Harvest Moon Trail. And we are going to here, this is, um, this is a plan that WSB had before, and I really like this plan. They had it through all downtown, which is all Webster, but I, I wanted to modify that a little bit and have it connected straight to our trail so we can have one, like one way for that. Um, this is how it might look. This is a cross section of uh, the road there, and this is the planners on the side. It's option one. And this is the other side of it where Altamar gas station is. This is West Main. This is also going to be part of it, connecting that to um, the other side. And that's it. Thank you. Ahmad, thank you very much. And, and thank you for coming to visit us uh, this evening to, uh, to make this presentation. We appreciate uh, your time here. and. Uh, and the work that uh, that you did on our behalf. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have a question. Thank you, Worship. 
Hi, Maz. How Hello. are you? Good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So the part of Webster Street yes. that w it would go down to one lane, Yes. which part is that? That's the part where the arena is. Patties to the arena. Patties to the arena. Yes. Okay. A bit from station lane to the arena? Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, if I was right there and I see yeah. it, that's sort of yeah. how my brain works. Um, but yeah, okay. That answers that for me. There, it's, already, it's already two lanes. Right. Which, when I'm driving on it, I get confused at that point because I'm switching from one lane to two lanes where yeah. at, that, at that point you're just confused of driving on that road. So if we make it into one lane and have use from the other lane, yeah. and then uh, going towards Maine, then it splits back to two to, for you to go right or left on that road. Say that last part again, sorry. If you look at the end of there, yes. see that dashed line? Yes. So that's where it goes to Maine. So yes. that's where the line, like, I mean, the one way lane would split back to two. I and see. And you would go left and right. Okay, yeah, I like that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, oh. that. Councillor Sabian. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. I just want to um, thank you for uh, all you did for Kenful because I've heard thank a lot you. of good things about you. So I wish you the best of luck in your future um, role. I just have a couple questions. Yes. Um, what, do you know if the fire department was, was contacted at all? Because they do come out on that piece of Webster there. And that's, it was two lanes, and I know that might be difficult. And, and I mean, I'm, I want to see a bike lane. I'm just, I get nervous about um, first responders and when it becomes one lane. So I don't know if anybody was contacted. The fire department wasn't contacted at that point, but mm -hmm. we have done it in a way uh, that it could have any truck turn there. No problem. Uh, the lane is wide enough. It's 4.5 meters. Um, but yeah. And are these um, double, I don't know what you want to call them, double sidewalks, I guess, for bikes? And are they all the same size from one end to the other end, or do they change? You mean the multi-use trail? Yeah. Yes, they're three meter all the way. Okay. Yeah. So one and a half on each side, or they're three and three, you mean? Three. So you there's six the meters then. So you mean the multi-use trail? Yeah, right? like the, the walking side is how wide, and then the biking side. Okay, no. All right, so the, the asphalt multi-use trail, yeah. it's going to be three meters all the way from just this way to stay to Webster. You okay. Mm -hmm. And then when connecting on the road, you're going to have 2.8 meters, the full width. of, So it's 1.4 each lane. Mm -hmm. So that's how it, okay. so we're going to okay. make it. Thank for, you. For just yeah, for just biking. And then the pedestrian has 1.5 meters for sidewalk. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you, Ahmed, for, for the presentation. I like it. It looks, it looks great. Um, would it be fair to say um, that there's two lanes uh, right now on Webster? We're going down to one. But that would be quite a large lane because you wouldn't need um, an entire lane for a bicycle uh, path. Yeah. Right? So that one lane coming down... Webster should will be larger than it's than a super just wide lane. right. It'd be an extra wide lane yes. coming down. Okay, so that's that's how we're able to get emergency vehicles and that everything turning and so on. Correct. Okay, good. And um, up on uh, yeah. Cornwallis and Justice Lane. Can I go back to that? Word? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's this a new crosswalk going in there, I believe. Yes, is that correct? Is. Yes. Yeah, okay. And so would there be overhead lights on that? Yes, there is going to okay. be an, a new RF, RRFB yeah. with solar panels there. Okay. So. The Wolfville style ones? Yes. Oh, yes, okay. That are less expensive but quite yeah. effective. Exactly. Strobe, yeah. Okay. Good. I, I, I think this is great. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Ahmad on the presentation that he just made? All right, CAO, I'd like to give you the opportunity to uh, speak to Council on what our next uh, steps are uh, with regards to uh, the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Um, so I guess first what I'd like to say to Ahmad as well, thank you for your time and your energy spent here. Um, as uh, uh, Rachel had indicated, we were coming together as a team and Ahmad did a great job of pulling from all the work that was done to look for solutions when, whenever you would encounter problems. So I want to thank you. Thank you. And now doing a presentation to council, you can cross one more thing off the new guy <laughs> list. <laughs> did a great job, so thank you. And uh, so, you know, I think one of, the, one of the key things here tonight is, 
as this update is, this was budgeted as part of the capital budget that was just was just passed. Um, and we were running into some, uh, some challenges. And so this was a way to adjust and be able to meet, meet the financial uh, targets that were laid out as part of this proposal. And I think in many ways create enhancements. So uh, ways in which we were ensuring from the size of the lanes and the, the, the color use and the planter use and so on, so that it's not just about creating a trail or not just creating a lane, but it's about making something that really, uh, really, really works. And so um, what I would ask here tonight as part of this uh, update is that if council has any uh, questions coming out of this or any thoughts, please pass them through to myself. The team meets regularly on this and then we can come back together if there's any questions or concerns. But um, this is really about uh, an update and getting around a couple of challenges we ran into and I'm um, came up with some great solutions that the team was able to work in. So want to pass that along here tonight and uh, thank you again, sir. Thank you. Councillor Zabia. Thank you, thank you, CEO Tro. So just for clarity, um, this is coming to council to vote on. Because uh, so um, this is this is essentially some adaptations that have happened to the plan that was put in front of council, and so um, if there are any concerns or questions, pass them back, and the group will will take a look at those. Okay. Um, at, at this point in time, we're just looking to see if there's if a keep council in the loop as to what our thinking is, but b if there's any. Uh, further questions or whatever that would be needed, then we have an opportunity to come back and address any of those concerns. And what's the timeline on this looking like? If from a tendering perspective, I guess I'll have to go to Director Bell to see what his thoughts were with regards to uh, putting something like this out the door. Thank you, CEO Troke. Um, Ahmad left us in good shape. He's got probably eighty percent drawings, you know, ready for tender. Um, plans and spec or the spec part uh, I need to complete and then uh, just finish off the drawing. So we're looking at um, once uh, McDonald and Henry Brayside uh, is tendered, getting this to tender toward the end of May, 1st of June. So I would, I would expect a, uh, you know, like a mid, early mid June closing and uh, ready for, for construction in the, in the heat of the summer. <laughs> but I just for clarity too, I, when we did the accessibility plan last year, my understanding was, and I think because I think Councillor Gerard and I asked the same question. These projects were going to come back in front of us each time, right? So we do still need to approve them. That's the way I understood it. Maybe I'm the only one. But I remember asking that question because there was so many ideas in there that each one was going to come forward that we would have to sit here as a group and decide do we want to do this one this year or... Thank you. CEO, please. So, so thank you, Councillor. And I think, uh, you know, uh, from... Um, a perspective of uh, initiating this, this is largely getting into kind of operationalizing uh, a plan. Um, I think if there are pieces to this that councillors had great concerns about, we can rework and bring that back. Um, I think it's really um, what, at least my understanding of this, was that conceptually folks were on board with where we were going. There was a plan and there were, what we ran into is some challenges kind of with where some of these pieces were and it was driving costs up. So what this does is meets the commitment um, that was made and make sure that we come within the budget that was approved for by council to do this work. Um, as always, uh, you know, as, as we go along in this, if council is seeing something that there is concerns or objections to, then you know we would look at that and see what that would mean from an operational perspective. Um, so uh, you know this update certainly, uh, if there are, are flashing red lights that a council ha a councilor has or concerns about, bring them back and we'll do our, our best to look at those and bring it back for a, for a conversation. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Um, you had mentioned budget. I think in our um, budget this was a million dollar project is are, are we still in even with the, the changes that I made made yeah so uh, so part of what we did is is this was really starting to drift because of some of the things we were running into and so the goal in all this was always stay on the budget as proposed and as we're making these adjustments any adjustment you make is not just a fix but can you make it an enhancement of what you were trying to do in the first place so um, I think that's that's overlapping a number of these things that we've had 
uh, is uh, studies that were done over time lets us do that. Um, but certainly the intention is always to make sure that we come in at or under what the original target was. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much for responding uh, to that uh, CAO. So I'll just say to members of, uh, of council that uh, you might want to take the photos with you and take a walk and, uh, and just kind of visually situ situate yourself uh, out there to see the work uh, that has been done and, uh, and consider you know, what, it would, uh, what it would look like um, based on this work and any, any concerns you have. Uh, annotate your, your photos, uh, send the CAO an email, and, uh, and it will be brought to the wider committee. And I'm sure that uh, if we knock on, uh, on Ahmed's door, he will, uh, uh, Ahmad's door, he will um, help us out again and, uh, and get us back into, uh, into budget lines and into things uh, that can work for us. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you that um, that was one of the big things that, uh, that he did is, uh, is he took a concept that was made and, uh, and it was starting to get very costly as we were doing things um, um, based on uh, on the old uh, the old plan, and uh, he really came up with some amazing solutions. So uh, it's uh, it's one of those uh, wonderful things when you have uh, you have a young employee, uh, particularly a young um, um, term employee who's who's coming in and works on a project and and is really looking how to how to make it better. And uh, and so again, I'm I'm commending you for having done that, uh, Deputy Mayor. You have something to add. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, are we going to be putting something, um, I'm assuming we're gonna put something up on uh, our website sort of detailing this and sort of just to garner some excitement around it and, and just to give people a, a really good insight on what's gonna happen on a go forward basis? Yeah, thank thanks. you. <clears throat> Excuse me, thanks for that. Uh, so Kirsten um, is already working on a, a mapping piece so that you'll actually be able to oversee, over, oversee the, the, the layout every year as we complete more of the AT okay. grid. Um, so we'll be able to let people know what we're doing this year, what's in the coming years, with the total, how many kilometers have we completed of the AT plan, um, yeah. Yeah, so there will be kind of a special, I'm looking at, at Jen, but there will be a special website dedicated to this. Oh, oh great. There is one up now. There is one up now. It, we're just getting the, all the detailed stuff okay. on it. Yeah, it's going to be super cool. Okay. Now that she's all certified and stuff, she was too busy before, but no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director Bettingfield, might be worthwhile um, just uh, putting out to the public there the amount of that very large grant that we got um, to complete the AT trail and is helping with a, a lot of this. Yes, absolutely. And if, if that's not up there already, then we will put it up there. Um, yes, because we did get time. a lot of funding. Yeah. yeah. Looking at Jen. She's already got it. She's on it. It'll be done before the meeting. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. <laughs> Again, if you have any comments, please, to the CAO, and then they will go out to, uh, to the committee on this. Uh, so I'll just uh, remind uh, members of council, when you are, uh, are speaking, please speak into uh, to the microphone. Uh, it is our intent to provide uh, the best possible service, uh, particularly for our hearing impaired, as, uh, as we move uh, to an, an accessible means uh, for transmitting our meetings uh, to all. So our next item is uh, the Chief's Report. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'll do an overview of my reports that were submitted to the board. They're accurate as of March 31st, 2022. So for finances, the trends continue. The building was expensive to operate this year. Uh, we were over, but received a grant, which balanced it out at the end with 28,000. Um, the vehicle operations maintenance budget was over. Uh, due to not having a new vehicle. So we spent a lot of money fixing vehicles and the overtime uh, was up a little bit. Uh, a lot of it was due to COVID related things like watching prisoners, taking people to court and uh, sick calls due to COVID. Uh, total police protection was in at 98.7%, which was good. Uh, from a chief report, COVID's having an impact on our staffing right now. It's manageable, but we're noticing more now than we did at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, more people have been off. Uh, the other account ended under the budgeted amount, just under $17,000. 
for my bylaw report, uh, the trends can, are the, similar to what they have been. The one change is we've had 25 taxis inspected this year, so our taxi inspection in, for March has been completed. And for calls for service, no significant trends other than the mental health calls are still high and they continue to be high. And the other thing we have is our community crisis navigator will start next Monday, so we're excited for that. Mm. Any questions? Excellent. Thank you very much, Chief. Are there any questions for the Chief? Looks like you're getting off tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chief. All right, moving right along, Engineering and Public Works. Uh, Director Bell, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Snow, and good evening, Council. Um, my report for April. Um, the Kempel Water Commission, as, uh, as Director Cole mentioned, at the April 27th uh, meeting of the KWC, the operating and capital budgets were presented and uh, ratified. Projects include upgrading water mains and services in the McDonald, Henry, and Brayside subdivision, upgrading the Prospect Water Treatment Plant, uh, developing a new production well in the West End well field, and upgrading the Prospect Overlook Booster Station. Under sanitary sewer area service, uh, our sanitary sewer laterals continue to fail on, on many of our older streets. Um, the town's policy is that property owners are responsible for the maintenance and replacement of the sanitary lateral on the private side uh, of the property line to keep the line clear and flowing all the way to the sewer main in the street. If a section of the lateral has failed structurally on the town side of the street limit, the town is responsible for uh, the replacement of this section. To my knowledge, we are the only uh, Nova Scotia municipal unit, or one of the, on one of the only ones uh, that provide this service. Most cases, uh, um, it's the homeowner's responsibility all the way to the street. I think we changed that a number of years ago. Um, it's cost us a lot of money, I must admit, over the years, but uh, I still think it's probably the fair way to, uh, to handle uh, replacements in and under our streets and uh, to cover the, the reinstatement costs of sidewalks and curbs and, and asphalt. Um, so the sanitary sewer operational and capital, or operating and capital budgets rather, will be presented uh, likely at the, at the end of this month uh, to council. To council. Um, I say at a future meeting, but it will be no doubt um, at the end of May. Um, under Public Works, this year's patch paving contract was tendered in late April. Uh, the successful paving contractor was Howard Little Excavating. Uh, we can expect the start of downtown patch paving within the next two weeks. Uh, probably actually within the next week or so right now, once their plant is, is open and operational. Um, so now that the weather has improved, our public works crew are, are out and about uh, refreshing the line, line painting on the streets, uh, making the town look pretty again. Um, under projects, uh, design work is well underway for the capital investment projects approved at last month's uh, council meeting. The first project planned to be tendered is the McDonald Avenue subdivision rebuild with other projects uh, tendered shortly thereafter. Uh, the rest is just public engagement and meetings and things. Uh, so that is my report for April. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Director Bell. And we have a question from Councillor Zamian. Thank you, Director Bell. I have three questions, um, three. three different things in no particular order. But the first thing I wanted to ask you, um, I had a few citizens reach out to me last week about um, Leverett Avenue and on Klondike when people are going in there to park to look onto the Miners Mar Miners Mars. There's no way out of there, so there's a lot of traffic and people are just worried about children this time of the year. And yep. I know we can't put no parking signs up, but is there any way there could be signs up that said parking is at the courthouse, you know, behind the courthouse or anything to kind of help had, with that yeah. congestion in there? I've had conversations as well with, uh, with, with residents in particular that live, especially on that corner where, where Leverett turns mm -hmm. to Klondike. Um, certainly the inside corner is a bad spot yep. uh, to, to park. Um, so I don't think that, it's not that we can't put them up, I think perhaps we really should be encouraging, especially on that inside corner, no parking. I mean, it's a, it's a narrow road now at best, and yeah. um, in even the summer it's gonna be um, a busy spot. The County of Kings are gonna be replacing their regional sewer force line that goes you know, from, from behind the Justice Center um, across the trail and then through, through Leverett. It's gonna be a construction zone, uh, not that uh, is anything to do with the parking issue, but it'll, it'll be a, a busy spot this year with lots of other things going on. Um, but yeah, I, I think lots of folks do park on the the Mars side of Klondike, and that 
it gets more complicated when they park on both sides, for sure. So I think we'll need to do something on the inside corner. Yeah, the, whatever, even it could the inside parking corner. is behind the corridor or whatever. The, yeah, would some, know some proper signage. I'll talk to Rachel too. Okay, we'll, that would be good. And the other thing, um, I've had a lot of people reach out to me that work in the uh, post office building. Um, and the sidewalk from the, from where the, a lot of them park at the arena and the sidewalk doesn't con continue around. So a lot of them kind of go from the arena into the parking lot of the post office in the back there. Yes. And there was quite a few of them in the last month. They just were wondering if we could ever cut a curb and rather than build a sidewalk so that they could park there in the wintertime because it's quite slippery and, and dangerous. There's a couple sections there, you know, even if there was just a little entryway into the next parking lot. From the, from the back of the arena yeah. into, into the Yeah, and then the people the... that work in that building wouldn't have to go down the road. We'd be crossing over private boundaries, would we not there, Bev, I think? Um, the traffic though, it should be. Hmm. Yeah. Certainly, I, I think I'm following you now and I'll look at it yeah, a little closer. Yeah, but, that would be um, good if you could look at that. And... Because there is no, yeah, there's no sidewalk on that inside. On that side, On yeah. that side of Webster, just on the, on the Baptist Church side, so I see what you're saying. And, yeah. then, and then in the wintertime, there's mounds of snow there and they don't want to jump over the... And my last thing is, I know you just said patching is about to begin, but I'm assuming Bonavista is on there. Definitely is. We start, start with the down tour. That, <laughs> the west entrance, which would be what Terra Nova. Yeah, uh, it's it's really bad. More yeah. than patching, it needs yeah. to, to be milled out. I think it's 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 structurally. Okay, I'll let them know. Thank you. You let them know. Thank you. All right. Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Richard. Um, Dave, just wondering. I've seen a few spots where we've got pylons up, where storm sewers have undermined. Do I, do I see more than normal? It, it, it just, it seems like- It I seems do. like more than, yeah. than a typical uh, spring year. Some of them are sanitary main, or like some of them are manholes, some of them are, are storm catch yeah. basins. It seems like a lot of them are not just in the curb line, but in, out in the middle of the travel lane. Yeah. I can think of a couple on Park Street that yeah. we've got three cones around one right now. Yeah, um, yeah they're, it's ongoing. Yeah. But I don't know that it's any more, but it seems, it seems to be. Maybe they're just off. It was a difficult winter for sure. It's, it's, yep. Uh, yep. The roads are, are uh, beat up everywhere for sure. Thank you. Welcome. Councillor Maxwell. Thanks, Dave, for your report. Um, just a, a couple of things I want to run by you. Um, first of all, I've discussed, this was discussed uh, in my, during my first term, but there's a crosswalk on uh, the corner of Oak Dean and Exhibition. And in that, on that crosswalk, there's a very large tree on the, um, on the exhibition side. Of, across, of the across the Mess and Jay's Diner? No, no, no further up, further up. It's on uh, Oak Dean. Oh, Oak Dean, not exhibition. Okay. Ex Oak, sorry. And, and so what happens there is that um, kids are walking out to cross that street and they're three, you know, a quarter or over halfway out onto the street before the oncoming traffic sees them because of the, the tree that's there. And I've had several complaints about from parents and, and grandparents and so on about that crosswalk mm -hmm. and wondering is there any way we can mark it better so that people see it. Now there's a lot of speeding going on on Oak Dean, but that's a... a a dangerous crosswalk there and an accident I think waiting to happen so if you could take a look at that well yeah I was thinking in the wrong place but certainly Oak Dean on the it's on, on the it, east end of exhibition where it meets Oak Dean yeah, yeah. exhibition and Oak, and, Oak, and Oak Dean okay so okay. that's one thing um, uh, garbage cans we lost one on Oak Dean yes we're yeah. still trying to locate some new ones they're a, okay. they're a hard thing to come by the tree the pole mounted Full mounted garbage cans. We have no extra mm. ones, and they are, are hard to get. Okay, they have so that's still on your radar. Yes, it, it is for sure. Okay, that's good. And uh, I think you had a complaint from someone on Colonial, but I think that's been solved. So it has. for now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. One more? One more. <laughs> there is a big manhole on Wade Street, and it, the pavement is coming down, like it is falling through there. Yep, is that so in the... Is it's that in closer, the... To, uh, closer to Oak Dean. There's no pylon there, 
but if yeah. it gets much bigger, then because it's right out in the street. Way Street, but on the Oak Dean end. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Director Bell. Are there any further questions for the director? None? All right, thank you. Moving right along, uh, our next report is from the CAO. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Um, so uh, obviously a lot of topics covered already this evening. Operational capital budgets were passed by council previously. Water Commission budget was passed. Staff have been a busy busy applying for, for grants. You've heard some of them tonight we've been successful in. We have a number of them that are, that are out there and a number that actually are still coming in that we're applying for. Um, Intermunicipal service agreements, uh, means, means are ongoing with the CAO. In fact, we've got uh, another one tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and these are typically uh, um, working through some of the issues within it and some language and so on. Uh, boundary review, I'm going to be talking about it in a bit, so I'll, I'll leave that till we're covering that. On the development front, uh, you saw the number of permits that uh, have been pulled. Uh, we're getting a lot of phone calls on a, on a regular basis with folks who are looking to do business here in Kenful, so um, good on that front. Um, and uh, basically a number of calls actually early in the, uh, earlier in the month, there was a lot of calls around the proposed provincial property taxation plan, which we know there was some changes to that, but uh, municipal units were busy um, working through that and a lot of conversations uh, around where it was gonna take us. So obviously uh, the water and the beans has changed on that. Um, and then, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, the Apple Blossom logistics are a piece we're working through trying to, to restart um, Apple Blossom after the last two years. Um, the, the biggest piece on this is making sure that the resources are there and the planning is in place, both from an emergency perspective, but also who's doing what. Uh, a lot of faces have changed, a lot of people, um, a lot of the events are changing, you know, things that are either not going to happen or new events that are going to take their place. So. The logistics around that have been uh, an ongoing conversation. So I think I'll leave that there with a number of other things we're going to be touching on shortly. Thank you very much, uh, CAO. And we do have some questions. Councillor Zabian. Thank you. Thank you, CAO. Just wondering if you could give us an update. Um, I didn't catch the CBC the other morning, but I guess there was an update on the comfort station coming to Centre Square. And I don't know if anyone in here has been briefed. I wasn't. So I just want to know if you could tell us when it's coming and maybe some more details. Sure. Thank you. Or lo the location, too, might be. Sure. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so we're actually in negotiations right now to try and uh, work through the financial end of, of this. So there's a, a grant certainly has been received, and there's also been some other funding received through uh, KBC. So this is one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, you, you push and push and push, and then all of a sudden everything kind of lands. So um, certainly uh, we're going to be happy to do... Uh, a full update on this, just logistics. We want to make sure this is going to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so as soon as uh, I know for sure that that's going to work, then I can come back with all the dollars figures for council. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Huntley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Dan. I wanted to know about the intermunicipal service agreements, the meetings that you're having. I know they're ongoing. <laughs> how, are, how are they going? Do you feel like we're getting somewhere? <laughs> Uh, Loaded question. <laughs> well, you know, so so thank you for that question. I actually appreciate it. Um, you know, typically what happens in in the CAO meetings is kind of working through a lot of the nuts and bolts. Um, typically, what will happen is uh, when when the mayors and warden get together, they kind of get hit with each one of these IMSAs in kind of rapid rapid fire. I mean, there's there's time spent to discuss it and and folks' positions, but. What you really do is take the time to find out ahead of time if there's things in there that kind of make people uncomfortable. Is there pieces of that that if there were some uh, changes in the briefing material, because that's ultimately what you're doing, is you're creating the briefing material for when the mayors and warden get together. So um, one thing I could say is the CAOs across uh, the valley and, and, and beyond actually work really well together. There's, uh, there is a really good... Um, desire to see that these are successful when we get together and uh, you know folks uh, folks work in a way that 
Um, there's no punches get pulled. So you're not surprised by anything. So I, I think they are quite good. I think it's developing relationships amongst there's, there's You know, in that case, there's even a lot of new players who have been around that table. And so I believe that they're really good at getting um, the issues on the table, giving us a chance to create briefing material. And, uh, and then so once it does get in front of, of the mayor's and warden, that uh, what they have has been, you know, pretty, pretty thoroughly vetted by all the folks. Thank you. And just to add from a mayor's perspective is, uh, is we are getting very fulsome briefings before we're asked to make decisions and, uh, and from a variety of people. So that I'm going to say that that's the really good part of it. And we are dissecting these things um, because at the end of the day, it comes down to dollars in our budget. And, uh, and we all want to be paying um, equitably for the services that uh, that are being rendered to us uh, through these uh, intermunicipal service agreements. So uh, we have a, a really great uh, working uh, working relationship from that perspective. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Um, permission to direct to CA of Tro? Please. Um, with respect to the Apple Blossom Festival, I know um, there's some trepidation with some of the, um, you know, citizens and where we haven't done this in a couple of years. And, and I know when we were at um, the Remo meeting the other day, there was some discussion around with large gatherings if Remo would be, you know, uh, regional emerging management, you know what I'm talking about. If, if, they're, if they're going to form part of um, the alliance with, with Kenful Police and if they're going to be part of that, I just wasn't sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. So, uh, part of part of the uh, the interesting part at the beginning of this is um, from a from a committee and a player's perspective is making sure everybody knows who's on first, and and so Remo making the connections with the folks, kind of what making sure that their expectations around what they would need and what they can bring to the table was important, just for people to know what that was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think second to that, um, you know, the boots on the ground planning really comes between. Uh, Kenful Police, um, RCMP, you've got um, the committee and then our public works team. And, you know, so coming out of um, the last two years, knowing if you've got volunteers available, what the roles of those volunteers and them being briefed on what they mm -hmm. do, who they turn to. Um, so really that sequencing is what kind of is the important part. You know, we, we kind of know here in the town what it is we need to bring to the table. And I think the committee knows what they need to bring, but how do you make those two things mesh? Mm -hmm. And so that's the part right now is that we're formalizing the agreement um, with those pieces coming together so there's no ambiguity, but also what do you do if? And so who do you call, who's available, who's going to be a resource that's available to, to support? And so Remo uh, certainly has been, as, as you're aware, mm -hmm. has, has come to the table not just with who they are and, and what they bring, but also um, you know, basically making themselves available to help with the support and the plan inside of it. Okay. So um, it's a bit of that, you know, forming, storming, norming kind of routine that you see <laughs> yeah. with this stuff. Um, and, and we're working our way through that to make sure. And, and quite frankly, you know, this is a bit of a streamlined apple blossom. Yes. Um, and, and part of that is getting, getting your toe back in the water again to make sure that, uh, you know, this is going to work right. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions for the CAO? All right, moving right along. Um, we have uh, business arising, uh, the Mentoring Plus quarterly report. Uh, CAO, did you wish to, uh, to speak to that? Thank you, yes. Um, so uh, Mentoring Plus uh, report, um, mm -hmm. there's a number of, of pieces of information here. I did have an opportunity to meet with uh, Mr. Michaels, who's the, the head of the um, of Mentoring Plus. And, and part of, I just wanted to, you know, and while some of this is touched on the report, but really the, uh, they've kind of got about a year uh, approximately of, of funding left. Part of what they're really doing now is putting some focus on the attachment of, of younger individuals, particularly with the healthcare sector. Um, it's one of those pieces as they've been moving along, they're, they're getting interest from younger individuals in this area. They've got a number of folks who retired from various professional aspects. And so, um, they're starting to kind of pivot a little bit on that front to make sure that they have all the connections. Um, but also they're hoping to take not just from uh, the Kenful site, but the other sites that are doing uh, this work and then say, 
how can we make that available to a broader general area around each one of those hubs? And so um, there, there will be uh, much more information following, but I just did have an opportunity two weeks ago to sit down with kind of the coordinator who, um, you know, was very bullish about where, where he's going to be taking this next in their team. So the report here touches on a number of, of pieces, but there really is now a bit of a focus really on the, the healthcare sector and helping some of the youth kind of see themselves in that. And as we know, the last couple of years has been tough. Um, so I think they really want to make sure those folks who are interested in it make some connectivity with people who are in that sector to kind of give them a, not just a lens, but an understanding of some of the different types they might be able to, areas they might be able to train in. So I just wanted to provide that as a quick update. Thank you, CAO. Are there any questions with regards uh, to the report that we have? Go ahead, Councillor Gerard. Um, in the two or three years that we've done this, have we actually put a mentor with uh, a youth? Um, my understanding is is that um, the early stages of this, there was a lot of stops and starts. And I think that they were able to um, revamp the Kentful model to look a little closer to some of the things that come out in New Glasgow, which is kind of a year ahead. So I think in the last year uh, with COVID and some of the video conferencing ability, they've been able to make some traction. I think their hope is that, um, let's just say maybe the, the dozen or so very specific connections that have been happening. Um, I think they're hoping that um, this now can become a little more face-to-face -face than what they've been doing electronically uh, over particularly the last year. And, and of course, they've also had a number of folks on their side from a, a hiring perspective who have hired, get started, moved on to another position, and so those starts and stops. Uh, but I really think that um, this next piece of work and where they want to focus is going to give them the ability to have a little bit more face-to-face -face time between mentors and, and young individuals in the school, and it'll be their chance to really get to the place they really want to be. Thank you. Thank you. CAO, I was uh, remiss in, uh, in thanking the chief and directors uh, for the work uh, this evening. So if you could pass that on tomorrow morning at, uh, at CAC, we still have a couple of our directors uh, hanging out for, uh, for further stuff. But uh, this, this, I haven't got my, uh, my legs under me uh -huh. for this, uh, this new way of uh, not doing a motion yep. uh, for, uh, for reports. Okay, uh, can do. All right, uh, so we do, we have no correspondence this evening. However, we do have, uh, have new business and our first order of business is the uh, municipal boundary review, which is mandated uh, by the Nova Scotia UARB. And uh, CAO, if uh, you could give us an update on that, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Snow. So um, quick briefing note here in your package. Um, so as, as discussed previously, where um, the direction I was given by council was to go out and consult consultants. And uh, so as we begin doing that work um, and we're looking at what the other municipal units are doing, it's kind of 50-50. And so um, some have gone out and done RFPs, which haven't closed yet. Um, but um, you're also seeing a number of units that have decided to do this work in-house. So after some consultation here with, uh, with our team and looking at what was done back in 2014, um, we really believe that uh, this is a piece of work that can be done uh, in-house without going out to third-party consultants. Part of this is that, um, you know, essentially in 2014, um, the getting the, the information out to the public and asking for feedback, um, I think our, our storm team and our communications team here has come uh, even light years from where we were then in order to be able to collect information. And so when you even think about, uh, you know, the, the way that Reliance was done on posters and local newspapers to um, how information now can be done through the other mediums to collect that information and get feedback from folks. So um, what, I'm, uh, what I'm recommending and will recommend that a CAC put forward to, to council is that uh, staff uh, be directed to do this, this internal review to collect the information and bring a report back to um, council will be in its October meeting of, or I bring it back to the October meeting of CAC um, as opposed to going out and, and getting a third party to do that information. 
Thank you uh, very much, uh, CAO. So we do have uh, a recommendation and uh, to get this discussion on the table, a motion that CAC recommend approval to the May 30th, 2022 council meeting for staff's coordination of the 2022 municipal boundary review process and bring a report to council at the October 2022 meeting of council advisory committee. If someone could move that, please. Councillor Huntley, thank you. Second, uh, Councillor York, thank you. It has been moved and seconded that CAC recommend approval to the May 30th, 2022 Council meeting for staff's coordination of the 2022 Municipal Boundary Review process and bring a report to Council at the October, tw October 2022 meeting of Council Advisory Committee. Is there any discussion on this matter? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Permission to see a trope is is this a pretty time-consuming thing for staff or is it um, they can do it in fairly short order I think the um, going back and taking a look at what the comments back from the utility review board were uh, the last time so th the process was successful in meeting its mm. outcome but they did encourage that more uh, more reach, more consultation could potentially be done. Okay. And, and that's where I think after asking the question internally that um, our, our communications folks felt that they could do a really good job. Okay. So the emphasis here would be in the next, you know, 30 days, putting the plan together, mm -hmm. lining up kind of those um, ability to collect the information. Mm -hmm. Because once it's, once it's collective, it's about that reach, it's about that yeah. ability. Yeah. So, um, it's, so the, the short answer is for probably the better part of, let's call it the first month and putting the plan together will be the time consuming part. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, making sure that each one of those um, opportunities to consult um, happen. And then, you know, if there's any hitches or glitches, make sure you fix them and make sure the folks have the opportunity exactly. to, to get exactly. their voice heard. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any further discussion or questions for the CAO on this recommendation? Are you ready for the question? The question is on adoption of the motion for CAC to recommend approval to the May 30th, 2022 council meeting for staff's coordination of the 2022 municipal boundary review process and bring a report to council at the October 2022 meeting of council advisory committee. Voting is now open. Point to Jennifer, see if that works. <laughs> you started that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, um, voting is now closed. Yes. <laughs> and Councillor Zavian indicated he was a yes. The motion is carried. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, we have several uh, requests uh, for decisions. Our first one is uh, with regards uh, to the noise uh, bylaw and uh, CAO, I will um, hand it over to you to provide uh, council with an update on this matter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so at the April 11th uh, CAC meeting, direction was given to consider uh, three components or three potential changes to the noise bylaws. So point of reception, adjusting the daytime decibel limit to 70, and then also looking at in the measurement of noise by conducting the measurement at least six feet from any large structure such as a, just a house. Included in our, our briefing note at that time was also what some other jurisdictions um, had done. And so um, as, as looking at that work, um, having some consultation internally, talking to our town solicitor, one of the things that um, it became for me very apparent is that when you look at the Municipal Government Act, um, it talks about the uh, power to establish a bylaw. And so in particularly 172D focuses on um, bylaws, which nuisances, nuisances, activities, or things that in the opinion of council may be or may cause a nuisance. And so as, as I took some time looking at uh, 
some of the bylaws, such as what Halifax Regional Municipality has and so on, um, they, they focus a little bit less on the measurement of the noise for the purpose of it's very specific when you look at what is it that council determines a nuisance, then you measure, then you enforce. And, and one of the things is, as I kind of was looking at, let's call it that objective standard, um, is I wasn't 100% clear if, if council had had a full discussion around um, what is it that we're hoping to uh, prevent as part of this bylaw. So we're, we're adjusting the bylaw and full disclosure, I wasn't here when I know this got created and I'm sure there was lots of robust conversation. But I think as we start tweaking or making adjustments to, to these bylaws, I think that for staff, and certainly I can, I can say, in order to make sure that we're writing this in a way that we're capturing what is the nuisance, what do we wanna measure, and then turning this over to a bylaw officer or a police officer to say there's an enforcement, we have to kind of get to the nub of this. So I'll give you an example. In a university town, you may say, look, anything that happens after a certain time, if I get a phone call from a police officer, and it may not even be about the level of noise, but there's a party happening in the next, in the next backyard, police are allowed to go in and say, this is a nuisance, shouldn't be happening after this time. Measurement may not be a factor. Versus if you're living in a place and there's a helicopter, say, landing on a hospital roof, well, between certain hours that happening, maybe that's an issue. So um, part of, I guess, in creating clarity here, I wanted to make sure that before we started adjusting levels, we, there was at least some um, conversation around what is the piece we want to capture so that we measure it right and then we enforce it right. One of the things I'd like to also just say, and just as part of, um, part of the work we've been doing internally, and folks may not be aware of this, but one of the things actually that does get used in our noise bylaw quite regularly is the exemption clause. So um, today we have an exemption clause, and let's think about this from a construction perspective. So a construction activity knows that it's going to be doing something late at the night or early in the morning. So our current bylaw says you gotta give 10 days notice and if it's approved, then we as the town mail to surrounding residents a notice that this is gonna happen. So with mail, you may or might not even get it within that 10 days, but you know, typically on a construction site, 10 days, you actually don't know that your concrete delivery is gonna happen uh, late. You don't actually know that steel is gonna show up at the site and be dropped off of a truck. So. Just even think about from a perspective of this component, it would be much more even beneficial if we had a reduction from a construction perspective in the time limit to give notice, but even think about putting the responsibility then on the construction company to say, you need to go out and knock on the doors around there and say, you know what, this is gonna be happening. So people are aware and they know who is the person if I'm not happy to go talk to instead of in their mailbox, potentially a couple of days after the noise occurs, that you know this would be something that happened. And I know that's, that's a subtle little piece, but it's a piece that clearly even when this was written, not that long ago, folks would look at an exemption maybe more from um, an event is happening or there's gonna be fireworks as opposed to hundreds of apartments are being built around town, which is a very different dynamic when you think about that. So, um, you know, these would be some of the pieces that, A, from an administrative perspective, that perhaps, you know, there should be some adjustment made to these. But also, I think in, in writing this, and perhaps in many ways, rather than just even adjusting some of the decibel levels, thinking about maybe a bit more of a rewrite so that we can have a conversation about what's a nuisance, how do we measure it, and then how are we going to enforce it? Um, and just to make sure that we're doing this from a, well, it's a bylaw, let's call it good policy perspective, that these adjustments are a broader conversation that we make sure that we're capturing what we wanna capture. And if there's an issue, we identify the issue and we make sure there's a correction. If there's no issue, if you, you, know, if you get a call, how are we gonna make sure that that's communicated from a perspective of what the decision is? So. Um, this is really me looking for a bit of a clarification to council 
And I know I've also thrown something new on the table that wasn't even part of that when it comes to the noise bylaw, but these would be pieces that if I have some feedback myself and, and working obviously with our solicitor, make sure that we capture as much as what we need to capture in this. And it's a bit heavier of a rewrite than what's there now, but I, I think it would serve us well in the long run. Councillor York. Thank you. Um, at our public meeting, we heard, I think as an overarching theme, or an overarching theme rather, was that um, people now are looking for ways to have community development and neighborhood relationships being enhanced. And if we're looking at uh, a noise bylaw rewrite mm -hmm. anyway, it might serve us to look at some of the ways in which we can improve community relationships and neighborhood relationships. And if that's looking at the root of the cause of the nuisance noise or what would be deemed a nuisance noise, then perhaps we can take that lens when we look through it, is to make sure that we're keeping in mind community relationships and neighborhood relationships while we're going through the process. Is there anything else? This is not going to have a motion uh, this evening. It's uh, where the CAO is uh, looking for, for feedback. Uh, so anything, uh, anything that you want to put on, on the table? Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Worship. I'll try and um, just put a, put a few thoughts out um, on this one. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to this sort of the easy piece first, the, the grant of um, exceptions. And um, I think I found the one that you were looking at, um, I, but I don't see a time frame in there. I don't see the 10 days in there, 6.5 under grant of exceptions. Um, I, I don't see a 10 days, and then I think in this one you're talking about it going to 48 hours. Uh, you say consideration for change for construction purposes, the temporary exception to 48 hours notice of the town, which I, I don't have any issue with that. I, I, I think that would work fine. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, at the very beginning it says at least 10 days, and that's for all the exceptions, Correct. not just 6.5. Okay, yeah. So I don't see an issue with that. I think probably um, when I look at the um, MGA section 172 and it talks about nuisances and activities um, uh, and things in the opinion of council that may cause nuisances and then it's referring to like noise, weeds, burning, odors, fumes, those sorts of things. Um, the discussions that I had with uh, some of uh, the citizens of the town weren't in relation to those things necessarily. It was more around to go further under the MGA where it talks about prescribing a distance beyond which the noise shall be not be audible and distinguishing between one type of noise and another. Um, you know, prescribing the hours and prescribing the decibel levels and things like that. And that seemed to be the big thing. And it wasn't necessarily with, there were a couple of folks that had issues um, it, with a neighbor in particular, but there were other citizens that came to me in the town that had the, the concerns really around the decibel piece and the hours of the day, whether it's the night or whether it's the day. And, and that was, that seemed to be the main, main focus. Um, so I'm a little confused around um, when, when we're not really talking about those other nuisances, it just seemed to be that one piece. And I think, you know, when we're talking about industrial equipment and machinery and those can also be looked at under, under uh, other exceptions. And that it's important that we're measuring what that nuisance is. And I, and I know what you're saying when you're referring to a university town and things like that, but that's not really our town. So I, and I might be missing the mark on this, but I feel like it's getting more complicated, but Maybe it should. I, I don't know. I'm just, um, those are just some of my thoughts, and they're kind of all over the place. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I can appreciate a lot of what uh, Councillor Savage is saying here. Um, my, some of my thoughts on this are that we're making this a whole lot more difficult than what it needs to be. Um, I think uh, our 10 p.m. curfew on loud noises and, you know, whooping it up in the street and, you know, playing loud music and things like that um, between 10 and 7 in the morning, I think, is, is will we'll handle most of, of uh, anything that's going on in the town. I think it comes down to um, 
a vibration type of noises. So if we put a, uh, a wind, uh, wind farm behind your house, um, then we need to know and we need to be able to measure, you know, what, what that noise is. Or if we have a loud, loud humming noise coming, you know, coming from, uh, for example, at the, at the, um, the hospital, um, that would drive me crazy if I was living over there, but that loud humming noise coming from, from the top of the hospital building. Um, I think that it's important that we have something on paper and there's no point in having an objective um, way of determining whether something is, is um, too loud or not because that then falls on the person who's making the, that dis, dis, you know, distinction. So I think it needs to be measurable. And uh, otherwise, it's it's useless. Um, if you're if you're not going to make it measurable, then uh, then I think um, we, we're just wasting our time and spinning our wheels. So I, you know, I don't see that this should be a difficult process. Um, sometimes I think we make things more difficult than it, than they need to be, and uh, I think we need to to just get it done. And. Uh, I would have liked to have seen um, the decibels in some of these other areas with noise bylaw levels. There doesn't seem to be anything in the report from other communities and, and what decibels that, that they're using. But again, um, other communities are doing it. Other communities have it uh, written in their, in their statutes. And, you know, I, I, I don't see the problem here of why we can't get this done. So those are my thoughts. Councillor Zabian. Thank you. Um, I have to concur with uh, Deputy Mayor Savage and, uh, and Councillor Maxwell. I thought we were just going to get other readings from other other units, I guess, in the province, just to kind of do a comparative. Um, I think we've, in my opinion, I think this is way too complicated now. And again, it's not a hard thing. I think when I was looking at it, and I, I myself, I think we were looking just to tweak the numbers and kind of get comparatives from other towns and other units. So that's what I was looking for when I asked to bring back. I uh, Again, I think it's, it's an easy thing to look at and, you know, it's not perfect and if it isn't, we'll look at it again. That's what we're doing now, a year later, right? So, or two years later, I guess. Thank you. Oops. Are there any other comments for the CAO with regards to this? Well, CAO, as I, uh, I said back in, in April, I did not have an issue with, uh, with the decibel levels that that were there, and uh, and I guess you you made me you made me think about this and and nuisance, and uh, I can remember one summer uh, there was a fellow that lived across the street from us, and he had this bass guitar electric with an amplifier, and he used to go out on his roof every single day and play this thing. He he couldn't play, but he would twang on it or whatever it was, and this reverberating noise would come out of it, and. Uh, and I was, uh, I, I was ready to scream, I'll, I'll say. And, uh, and I, I checked our bylaws, and, and there was nothing that, that met it because, of course, it was, it was during the day. Um, however, it was a nuisance. And, and I think that that, that to me, uh, you know, I sh other than having a, a, a tune gun, um, turn them into a tune, I, you know, it just, it, it was, it was a nuisance and there should have been something that enabled us to, to stop him from, from doing this. Um, however, at the same time, if, if you think about how many people in our neighborhoods put in portable air conditioners and, uh, you know, unless you have one of the, the, you know, whisper quiet ones, uh, the rest of them would not meet our current, our current levels. And, and is that a nuisance? And then if you think of all the people that are putting in um, um, the, the, you know, the built-in ones and, and the noise that is coming off of those motors. So I, I think that as we, as we electrify our neighborhoods, we're, we're putting more and more motors out there. And, and so there's almost this din of, of noise that, uh, that is, is being created by all these ways that, that we're saving the planet. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that those are nuisances. However, I, I think that, you know, we, we need to find a balance with this. And I really think the nuisance part is, should be the focus. There also has to be, you know, can we, are they enforceable? Because it's fine for our bylaw officer to go up there, write a ticket, but what happens when you go to court? And when you look at the number of times that our 
our noise bylaw has been used and how it's been used, um, it's really, um, as, uh, as Councillor York said, uh, really about improving neighborhood relationships. So, um, you know, I, I would like, uh, I'd like that focus. Um, so, Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Um, I, I agree with what you say, and I agree with, uh, with what Dan said. I, you know, we, we can push through a policy or a bylaw, but now that we've brought focus to it, to, to people that are paying attention, um, you know, you're absolutely right. What we want to eliminate is the, the, the nuisance, not necessarily every single noise. So I think we should take our time and, and do this right. So um, it is enforceable. And so it's something that um, when people do call and they have a, a legitimate complaint, it, it can be addressed by the proper um, department and it can be, uh, can be fixed. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. So in terms of the nuisance piece, CAO Troke, is it more about um, defining what constitutes as a nuisance and then looking at how to measure those nuisances? I'm just taking into, con in, into uh, play what the mayor said, you know, about you know, somebody playing a guitar and things like that. So would that be incorporated into the bylaw? Like, what constitutes as a nu nuisance? Because I, I agree, I mean, community relations are very important and that's, that's the cohesiveness that we want in our town. While at the same time, I think I had written down here about you know, the quiet enjoyment of our neighborhoods, right? And it's a balance, it really is for sure. So that's the piece I'm a little bit, that uh, is a bit ambiguous to me. Thank you. Thank you, and, and so um, in some ways it is a little ambiguous, um, you know, what I, so first we'll start with when you look at some of the other bylaws uh, that have been written, some have gone into great detail to give exemptions to certain malls and certain stores and certain warehouses because forever and a day these have been places where, you know, deliveries happen at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. And so just the truck backing up and the beeping and all those other things. So some communities have gone to great lengths to identify that, um, you know, exemptions happen in certain places. And, and the reason that they've gotten there is history of complaints and uh, trying to balance the conversation with neighbors to get to a place and perhaps even in some cases not being able to enforce or potentially hindering a business from doing its business. Mm. Um, I appreciate that um, this is not a perfect science. This mm. is, and, and that's one of the pieces that um, and, and so, quite frankly, actually, I'm really glad this conversation is happening the way that it is tonight because the enforceability of this on the back end, like we can write tickets anytime. Absolutely. The problem is, is that then those tickets are going to go into a court because people are going to challenge it. Right. And then, then you're going to be tying up our bylaws or you're going to be tying up our town solicitor, you're going to be tying up folks on, on these things. And so part of, part of what I would say is that in, in a policy or in a bylaw discussion, you try to identify is there, is there an issue? And where the conversation here is about being proactive. Um, and I think if the community is having a conversation about levels, mm. I think there's nothing wrong with adjusting levels as long as we recognize that we're going to run into a circumstance where something's not going to pass the level test, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be a nuisance. Oh, I see what you mean. And yeah. so, you know, the fact yeah. that, um, you know, uh, so I have a neighbor who has three heat pumps on their house mm -hmm. and they use propane uh, to, um, you know, dry clothes, which the exhaust from it is louder than a typical exhaust. And, mm. and so when everything in, in conjunction is going together, I can guarantee you that, you know, my neighbor's probably close to 80 decibels on mm. this hum from all those pieces. Mm. Everything is working perfectly. Everything is in tune. Um, would that pass the 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 decibel level? No. Is it a nuisance? They're kind of heating their home and doing all the things mm. that they're supposed to. Mm. So um, that's the piece I think that when we're when we're trying to bring this all together is that there needs to be um, uh, a reasonable expectation about noises that would emanate, whether it's from a neighborhood, from an industrial park, mm -hmm. or whatever. And that um, if we write in a very specific number, 
um, I think that we have to recognize that that is intended to be a measurement when you determine there is a nuisance and something is now being measured so that you can try and enforce it. Mm -hmm. But um, I am uh, confident based upon what even some readings we've done with our own decibel, some day-to-day -day things that are happening in houses. Mm -hmm. um, if you just went and started measuring, you're going to find a lot of things don't pass the threshold. And so um, I think all of the updating is, is good if it is meeting the intention. But if it becomes something that, uh, you know, quite frankly, if we had um, a neighbor all of a sudden put in a heat pump and the other neighbor hated the noise and that was working perfectly the way it was, but it was one decibel over, mm -hmm. does that create a nuisance? Well, it's, it's, it's a permissible device and it's running the way it's supposed mm -hmm. to. The question becomes, is that a nuisance? So um, I, I, I really just think that we, by tweaking one piece or two pieces without kind of having that broader understanding of what we're trying to accomplish, um, and, and, I, and a Councillor Zabian is right, we can always go back and rewrite, but we might also find ourselves with a whole bunch of tickets and time in court mm -hmm. trying to defend something if it's not really um, a nuisance at the beginning of all this, it's just a threshold that, you know, we, I'll use the example, do we always give out a speeding ticket in a 50 zone at 51 kilometers mm, an hour? Yeah, right? yes, yeah. Okay, thank you, that clarifies a bit more. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you, I think we're losing a little bit of sight. Again, when, you, when we start making mountains out of molehills, we're gonna, we're gonna um, lose sight of things. The noise is not in front of the, let's say the, the, the heater on the, on the side of the house. You don't take the measurement there. You don't take the measurement right from the exhaust. You take the measurement from inside the other house where the person is being annoyed by that noise. I would say if a person's heat pump is making so much noise that it's 70 decibels across the yard and into the other person's house, then they probably need to have their heat pump looked at because that's too much of a noise. I mean, you know, you don't take it from right in front of, in front of your TV. You know, you don't take it from right in front of your stereo. You take it from where that person is receiving it. That's the point of reception. That's where you take the measurement. And yes, something could be a nuisance. And Mayor Snow, you know, you may not have liked that guy's bass guitar, but your neighbor on the other side of you may have loved that. And so it wasn't a nuisance for them, but it was a nuisance for you. That's personal. And you can't measure personal. personal. And you can't walk up and give somebody a ticket and say, you know, this is a nuisance to your neighbor, so we're gonna give you a ticket. Because the other neighbor on the other side, it may not be a nuisance for. It has to be something that's measurable. If you can't measure it, you can't ticket it. Because nuisance is just that. It's just up to that individual person who is receiving that. Th that's the nuisance, if you're getting my drift here. Um, so, you know, I think there's not going to be, I can't see tons of tickets coming in uh, over a noise bylaw, 70 decibels, if we're doing it correctly. If we're taking the measurement from the point of reception, that's not going to happen. If we're following our 10 p.m. to 7 a.m noise bylaw, we're not going to have any complaints in that period of time. Um, so I think, you know, I, really, I, I don't know why we're having such difficulty with this. Again, it seems to be a Kenful thing when other communities can get these things done and we just can't seem to get it done. So, I mean, that's, that's my point of view. I'm, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I think all we have to do is look at the uh, unsight, uh, unsightly premises bylaw. If you leave things ambiguous and leave it up to uh, the person enforcing it, what is unsightly to me is not necessarily what's unsightly to Dan or other people. And if you if you don't have, uh, as Dan said, uh, you know, uh, uh, an actual nuisance clause. Um, I think, I think we're gonna run into problems and I think the enforceability. So what we've seen from other bylaws that we've had in town 
if we can't enforce it, there's absolutely no point in having it. Solicitor, I see you've made your way. Did you wish to, uh, to speak? I, I just wanted to uh, uh, perhaps add a little context um, to this discussion. I, I concur with the CAO. I think this is important policy discussion. Um, the, uh, uh, so I, I was just having Director Gentleman refresh my memory. Your latest changes to the land use bylaw would allow somebody to come along and build a house eight feet from their neighbor, four feet from their property line, their neighbor four feet from their property line. So um, uh, I'd like you to consider if the neighbor builds a house eight feet from your house with lots of windows that open on that side and your heat pump is on that side of your house, and you set a decibel limit that perhaps put that, puts that offside, is that what you're intending to capture? And maybe it is, but I think it's those sorts of situations that you need to turn your mind to. So with changes, densification, which is what you folks just did recently with your land use bylaw, you've encouraged densification. Neighbors are gonna be closer to one another. There's gonna be more opportunities for conflict and noise is usually the first potential conflict. And so if you set an objective standard, a, a measurable objective standard, as a lawyer, I love that. Um, but be careful what the objective standard is and what the objective of that objective standard is, right? Um, the, uh, uh, and, and so, if I was to put myself in your shoes, I think those numbers mean everything if that's the approach you take. Those numbers mean everything. You're encouraging densification. And uh, we all know what a nuisance generally looks like, but then we get into these ones like we've been talking about, heat pumps, well, uh, uh, pool pumps, those things that are electrical when we've lived in neighborhoods that have relied on fossil fuels for heating that don't make any noise, right? Um, so now we're moving to electric motors, as the CAO said, and we're gonna have a lot of those around us, whether they're rooftop mounted units or, or they're in side yards or backyards. And um, if you have a good understanding of, of what uh, those decibel limits look like, then perhaps that puts you in a position where you can choose objective numbers. I wanted to use another example of how technology has improved. If you're into antique cars like I am, you know that a muffler on a car 50 years old is not the same as a muffler on a car today or even an electric vehicle which doesn't make any noise at all, right? So uh, uh, we've gone the other way on vehicles, they've gotten quieter and a vehicle may be totally legal and make too much noise to your ear, but that's the way it was made, right? And if you adopt rules that now make something that was legal illegal, just keep in mind what the impact of that is. Thank you, solicitor. Are there any further points of view for the CAO to make note of? CAO, do you have enough information from us to, uh, I'm going to say, go away and come back to us with, <laughs> with something between you and the solicitor? Um, so thank you. And first of all, counsel, uh, I do appreciate the conversation. This is helpful, and I understand everybody's um, perspectives. And this is kind of what I, what I need, and it's the part I think was kind of missing when we were kind of having these absolute discussions. So um, certainly I will... Um, take my best stab at collecting what we've, we've had here tonight and bring back um, a document for council. And I would hope that if I don't capture um, the intent of this conversation or if I go too far in the intent, please 
uh, you know, provide me the feedback at that time. So we'll we'll give it our best shot and bring it back. All right, CEO. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so our next uh, item of uh, of new business is with regards to the heritage bylaw. Uh, Councillor Maxwell put in an RFD, uh, which was taken to staff, and we now have a report. And Director uh, Gentleman is here to provide us uh, with some feedback. Director Gentleman. Thank you again. Okay, as the mayor indicated, um, Councillor Maxwell did submit a request for a decision to direct staff to draft a heritage bylaw for the June uh, 2022 council meeting. At the end of the council's deliberation, staff were directed essentially to provide just a general overview of the Heritage Property Act for, C for tonight's meeting. Um, just to look at the pros and cons and what ifs uh, under uh, the adoption of a heritage bylaw. So the Heritage Property Act was passed in 1980. There were a few uh, amendments, amendments to that since then. But, and its purpose is to identify and protect built heritage building structures and districts that have historical, cultural, or um, architectural values. The act authorizes municipalities to establish a registry of locally significant heritage properties through the adoption of a heritage bylaw. Properties are registered by council on the recommendation of a heritage advisory committee. Now, you don't need to necessarily have that. The committee can be called whatever it might be. I mean, it could be CAC, it could be uh, a heritage advisory committee. Once a property is registered, any substantial alterations, including demolition, must be approved by council. And if council does refuse uh, those um, requested changes, including demolition, the applicant can wait a year and then they can do whatever they want to do. So the government of Nova Scotia Heritage Bylaw or a Property Act allows for different types of property registration based upon the property's his, uh, historical associations. For example, if a local business and its owners are known for contributing to the establishment of the town's economy, the property may have heritage value, um, that type of heritage value, uh, because of the person living in the building. It may not have anything to do with the building itself, structurally or age-wise. However, however, if the same property, um, if the same property affected the industrial economy of the province it may also have a strong heritage value as a registered uh, provincial heritage property as well so really heritage by or heritage properties or properties designated under any potential bylaw would have more of a local significance anything beyond that uh, could be uh, considered a provincial uh, property for designation in either case, the property's historical associations help determine its designation uh, once registered under the Act. It should be noted that the different designations do not re represent different um, levels of heritage value. So again, it really doesn't matter whether it's a, if it's a special place or if it's uh, the fact that somebody lived in a building. It could be somebody, you know, um, within a building that's only 50 years old rather than 150 years old or even newer than that. Um, and there are different types of uh, municipal heritage um, registration um, that could either be a pro an individual property um, that are deemed to have a local or community level of heritage value. Heritage value may include the architecture historical associations such as people live in there or events that may have happened or settings um, and provide important representation of the municipality's history. There's also the opportunity to uh, register municipal streetscapes which can occur when grouping of properties collectively are deemed to have um, local or community heritage values. These properties must all be visible from one vantage point in order to fall within that designation of a district. And then there's the conservation district as well, uh, which can occur at a much larger scale than uh, a streetscape. Um, <clears throat> you can also register municipal public buildings interiors, but those are, those are only public buildings, municipal town halls, provincial, you know, provincial buildings and things like that. And then there's also a municipal cultural landscape, which can 
occur when a distinct uh, geographical area or property uniquely representing the combined work of nature and of its people is deemed to have a, a municipal heritage value. Again, it's all significant to the town itself. A review of other municipalities who have heritage bylaws ensure that the designation of properties is voluntary. Though many municipalities do not provide specific financial incentives, there are um, provincial monies available for exterior renovations in the form of grants of, or, or a GST rebate. So if you do have a property that's registered, um, unless the town is providing any type of grants, uh, I think Yarmouth is one that does, Truro has a, is another one. I think they provide grants of $2,000 per uh, residential, but they don't provide it to the commercial component. And the city, being the big city, is up to $15,000. Um, so the financial incentives, without the town getting involved, it's really only the G GST, and there's a long form that needs to be filled out and sent back to the province for them to rebate the GST on any of the pro uh, material that you bought. And the material has to be specific to the maintenance of that historical significance. Additional considerations suggested by municipalities with heritage bylaws is ensure that designations are voluntary, um, establish a heritage committee which consists of historians and architects because for the layman staff, such as, we really, I have no um, expertise in the history of the town or any other town. I mean, that's obviously things that can be researched, but specifically the architectural nature of a building, whether it's Gothic, whether it's like, there's a lot of information that needs to be provided to help guide um, a municipality to, to deciding what it is that they're actually trying to save. What is it that you want to achieve by adopting this bylaw? Um, for instance, the, we did look at this back probably 10, 10 years ago Kings County, uh, the Kings County Museum had a map of properties that were identified as being over 100 years old. We're still in the middle of working on that map to pick out, identify the, those that were identified as 100 years. And I think the map was done 20 some, 20, 30 years ago. If you go back and look at half of those houses, they're either gone or they've been updated. Um, and um, some have some of the characteristics that uh, like maybe the cladding might be the original cladding, but the windows have changed, so they've had to re replace the windows with vinyl window windows, which you wouldn't be able to do under the bylaw. You'd have to have to replace those um, maintenance items with 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 um, products that, that meet the the age of the building. Um, I've also included. Oh yeah, and a property with a heritage designation is generally more expensive to insure because the replacement cost of improved material is more expensive. So it's those windows again. You have to have wooden windows. You can't use uh, vinyl windows. You have to have sometimes have things specifically made to make sure that it meets the um, heritage value of the house. And some uh, insurance companies have refused to insure properties with a heritage designation as well for that reason, because of the cost. Um, there are some attachments in the report for you to review um, some information from the Insurance Bureau, Bureau of Canada, Bureau of Canada uh, talking a little bit about insuring uh, heritage homes and I've also included some examples of other bylaws and it's one thing to have a bylaw but then you really need to start thinking about what it is that you're trying to, to save and come up with a matrix system to check off to see if anybody who might come in to have their property um, designated, whether or not it meets the criteria that has been established by the town. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that report, uh, Director Gentleman. Um, does anyone have any questions with regards uh, to this report uh, for, for the director? Uh, Councilor York. Thank you. Um, so just, I want to reiterate, or I guess clarify rather that um, 
if a bylaw or if a property rather were to be designated a heritage property, that it does need to be um, the exterior and the interior um, maintenance would have to be sort of era appropriate maintenance. So if it was stucco replacing stucco, wood replacing wood, you can't use other materials. Is my understanding for, yeah. from the material for the outside? For the outside, right? The internal is for public buildings only. Okay, thank right. you. All right, are there any further questions with regards uh, to the report before we move on to the whole RFD part of, of this? So just, uh, Councillor Maxwell, is this for Director Gentleman or is this with regards to your RFD? Um, oh, Director Gentleman. Okay, go ahead then, please. Um, Director, um, thank you for your work on, the, on, the, on this report. Um, a bylaw that we put in, in town can be pretty much whatever we want it to be. We can write it up to be whatever, even if we give it a heritage designation. The provincial heritage designation is a lot different than the town one. So we don't have to fall in line with the provincial heritage designation. No, no, that's correct. That's, but that's but the bylaws are pretty similar. I mean, it, it's it's just based the, the the main difference from my understanding between the provincial and the municipal is that each of the designations represents something significant to that community. So the province is provincial wide, right? Whereas the town. But we could we could include in ours that. Um, if you know if the windows need to be replaced, they could be vinyl windows. We could we could we could say things like that in. But in that's ours. not the point of having the bylaw. The bylaw is specific to maintaining the character and the vintage age of the buildings. Yes, I know. I understand what you're saying. But what I'm saying is we could do that. So let's look at the Cornwallis Inn. All right, they put new windows in there. They all put new, new windows put up new there, windows. they removed the front lawn, they, yes, they, they've, they've done, extended a number right. of things. So we could, we could have still allowed those windows to go into that building, even though we would have designated it a heritage building. We could uh, allow the renovations that have taken place inside that building it's even a, though yeah. we might say it's a town of Kentville Heritage Building because right. there's a big difference between a town of Kentville Heritage Building and a provincially designated heritage building. Because it's our bylaw. We craft it the way that we want it. True. Yes, but if, but if I, I suppose you could do something like that, but from my perspective, it just seems to go... Uh, in the face of the point of having a heritage bylaw to main to to well my I think basically what we're looking at or what I was the initial thing that I was looking at was to prevent the demolition of buildings in this town like the roundhouse like the original KCA building um, things like that those would be designated heritage buildings um, Oakdale House is a, a it's a he heritage building, um, but we probably wouldn't mind if you know they put new windows in there and they you know renovated the interior of it. It's <clears throat> still the basic facade is there. Yeah. So I'm saying is we can craft our bylaw, can we not? To be what we want it to be, it doesn't have to follow a provincial heritage. Designation or a federal heritage designation? No, it's not. No, 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 no. It's not. But I think uh, you know you, you have to be think, decide what it is that you're trying to save. So the heritage. So from what I'm hearing, the Cornwallis and you don't want that to be torn down. Whatever you designate right now, in a year, it'll be torn down if some if the property owner wants it torn down. It's just the way that the legislation is written. So, but in maintaining those those properties. Um, is it just the windows? Is it the doors? Is it, is it you know, how much is it that we're trying to maintain? Yeah, I, I think if in the bylaws that you presented to us to look at, um, every renovation made to those buildings that other communities had designated as heritage buildings came back to council for approval or to you for a permit. All right, so we would have to say, um, you know, if they wanted to do a complete uh, renovation on the inside for apartments and so on, that would come to council. 
and council would say, have a debate on it and say, yep, yeah, go ahead and do that. You're not disturbing the outside right. of the building. Well, we don't look at the municipal um, designation. It's not for private property internally. It's only for, min for public buildings like town hall yeah. or co old courthouse or something like that. If the Cornwall is in or any of the other private structures, homes would not, we don't look, we don't uh, deal with the internal uh, renovations. We don't, but other communities do. Other communities do do that. So Oakdale House would be designated as a heritage property in the town of Kenfield. Whoever owned it would have to come to us and say, um, we want to do this to that heritage building and we would say whether or not we wanted that to happen or whether we, you know, we didn't. And then they yeah. have 120 days have to wait and they can go and do it again anyway. But at least there's something, that's but, what I'm saying yeah. is, yes. Um, but no, I don't. Wickwire House has yeah. a provincial heritage designation mm -hmm. on it, yeah. okay? But there's nothing stopping us from, from making a list of heritage buildings in the town of Kentville and then going to those property owners and saying, okay, we've designated uh, your, your building here as a heritage building. And then much the same as if you look at the Hans West bylaw. Um, and, uh, and there's all kinds of ways for them to, you know, to appeal and, and, uh, and, and so on. So I think, uh, you know, I think we're, again, we're making it a bigger deal than it needs to be made and I think that we need to look at this as a way of preserving uh, the heritage of Kenfield as best as we can. Right now, we're not doing that, and we haven't done that for decades. And if we look at the designation for Hans West, their bylaw was done in 1994. This is 2022, and we don't have anything in the town of Kenfield. But there's the bylaw, but then there's also the criteria upon which they need to meet in order to be um, deemed to be a municipal uh, property. And we, that's the background work that needs to be done first. What right. is it and what part of the history of Kenful and its, and its right. architecture are we trying to, to uh, save? Now, and these bylaws that you presented to us have that. They, they have checklists there and they have... Yes. Um, yeah. Questions and so on that you would go through and you'd fill out and tick tick things off and then you'd say yes this qualifies. But again, is it? Am I not right in thinking that the bylaw is drafted the way that we as a council want it to be drafted? We don't have to follow a provincial heritage designation. We don't have to follow a federal heritage designation. We make the bylaw the way that we want it to read. Uh, well, CEO, yeah. uh, <laughs> If you could uh, tackle that one. Sure. Um, so first of all, um, um, I think um, we want to make sure that as a municipal unit, um, this is a this is a voluntary process. Um, we we can't go to somebody's house and say you're now a heritage building without their consent. So it, it is really important for us to make sure that we we recognize this as a collaborative piece of work. Um, and I think some of the semantics, and, and, and Councillor Maxwell, you're right, a heritage bylaw, we, we can draft it up to say what we weight as heavy or important when, when somebody is applying, and you go through those criteria, because there may be things that folks will come forward and say, my 1972 split entry, I think this is a heritage house, and you're not going to hit any of the criteria, you're going to score zero, and you're not going to be in. But yeah. if the town thought that this was something they wanted to preserve, then yes, you could, you could put that in place. I think the other piece though, and this conversation kind of um, has flirted in and out of, is there's, there's heritage buildings and then there's if you thought something was a landmark. And, and to me, um, you know, if, if, one didn't, if one wanted to have the flexibility of saying, look, um, this is an older building, it's a landmark in the community, and we want to recognize it as that, but we also want to have an ability for flexibility and how it's going to be renovated there, there's some other ways you can kind of approach that where you you start recognizing something as 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 a landmark that uh, maybe it doesn't have to have all the rigor as calling it a full a full heritage building 
So what I think, um, you know, Director Gentleman has, has laid out here is that in drafting this, you want to think about what the parameters about, what do you consider heritage? So, um, you know, look at what the oldest house or building is in Kentville and where do we draw the line where we say anything past that? No, you're, it's more modern than heritage. Um, when you think about is the town going to put any assistance into it? And again, just from a policy perspective, is it um, this is a gateway for someone then to apply for the provincial designation? Or is this about we're actually going to make some kind of assistance to the person for, for doing that? And then beyond the initial stages of this, and I know this is, this is kind of, you form a committee generally to review the application so that um, what happens is the application, while it ultimately gets approved by council, you have people who are experts in some of the components of this evaluate it. So I sat on a committee in another town where um, this very specific uh, type of design, early 1800 Scottish development was prevalent and people would want to make changes and often the change they would want to do was add an extra dormer to the roof and and the dormer um, was something that was not um, from a heritage perspective correct but it actually wasn't out of line which some other communities found them so they wrote in their heritage bylaw that it doesn't have to be exactly correct as long as it meets the spirit of the intended design of this of this building and so, um, and all kinds of people way smarter than me would look at it and say whether this was authentic, yada, yada, yada. But I think, um, I think what, you know, we're at, we're at the, the front part of what would be a collaborative process with homeowners, with business owners, and, and starting to talk about what would we see as the parameters for setting something like this up. Um, and because it's not just going to be about the first two that come through the door, it's also going to be a few years down the road when people are, new people are buying buildings and saying, I wouldn't mind making this look like it looked 100 years ago. And so they might want to put on the plaque because they might want to apply for the provincial one. And, and so um, you're right in that we get to pick what's in and we kind of get to pick what we find acceptable or not acceptable. Um, but I also think we want to, if it's going to be about trying to preserve the heritage, is it about more this is a landmark in the community and therefore we want it identified as that versus going through, you know, what would be a, a full-blown heritage designation for the town or in collaboration with the province. And so this is just, we're at decision points and there's a lot of pieces here I know that seem like that might be overkill but it's kind of the road you go down once you open up this door to say, if someone wants to do this, these are the things we kind of need from you so that we can know whether it's a yes or a no. Councilor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm hoping that the, the solicitor has uh, a comment about this. Like the, the, the longer the conversation goes on, the more it sounds like um, we want to start telling property owners what they can and can't do and that it's not a voluntary process that it's we can just knock on your door and say it doesn't matter what you do or who you sell this to um, if we say you can't do it you can't do it and I'm, I'm uh, I want to stay away from that thank you thank you Councillor York thank you um, if we get to the stage where we're drafting a bylaw, I would like to uh, also engage the inclusion and access um, and diversity committees to make sure that when we look at heritage, we have uh, in the town, for example, we'll have conflicting heritages. So we'll have the Jijiwak Duck, but we'll also have the Cornwallis River. So how do we, how do we navigate those conflicting heritages when we're looking at a heritage property or a heritage um, place or space? Um, there has long been, obviously, um, a history of um, you know settlers pushing away other and and the First Nations heritage and history I want to make sure that we don't exacerbate that moving forward thank you thank you <clears throat> Councillor Maxwell yeah just one one comment I didn't mean to make it sound like um, I was looking at individual family homes um, I'm looking at businesses so Wickwire House is a business. Oakdale House is a business. 
all right those are businesses um, so that's that's what I'm looking at if you read the West Hans bylaw if anybody took the time to read it um, I think it spells out very nicely the way that uh, a heritage bylaw would work require house is now a private home it was a business at the time. Uh, yes, yes. When the Peerlesses owned it yeah. and got that, that designation. But since then, it's... Uh, it's private now. Yes, okay. yes. So it's not, uh, it's not included in what's being said here. Yeah. All right. So, um, not that we have a recommendation, but um, are we prepared as, uh, as a CAC to direct the CAO to pursue drafting a heritage bylaw for review by council. You're moving that, Councillor Maxwell? I will. Oh, thank you. And the seconder? Second. And Councillor Zabian, thank you. So it has been moved and seconded that CAC direct the CAO to pursue drafting a heritage bylaw for review by council. Is there any discussion on this matter? Um, Councillor Maxwell. Yeah, I'm just going to ask my colleagues around the table, if you have not read the West Hance Heritage Bylaw, I highly recommend reading that one. It seems to be the, the one that's spelled out the best, as far as I'm concerned, um, of the three that we were presented. Kings County is good as well. Um, Yarmouth is, uh, I don't think Yarmouth is all that great, but they might think it's good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Director. Yeah, but I just also want to emphasize that it's just not the bylaw. The bylaw says what they can do. Then they go to their application form and there's a list of criteria that says this is what we will consider within our. Um, some have a numbering system so that they have to get so many points, and others are just checked off. But, you know, a bylaw, the part of the bylaw also is understanding what it is that we're trying to preserve. And so that criteria list also has to be part of the group. So that's really, so whether or not we're putting the cart before the horse, this is where a, a committee gets set up to see what we have. And yeah, because I certainly don't have the background to you know determine historical sites or buildings without having certain people brought in to who have, have that special knowledge. Thank you, uh, thank you, Director. Uh, Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Worship. Um, could I, through the chair, could I just get some clarification from Councillor Maxwell? Are you talking about a, like a 100% voluntary, um, we don't tell them you can only do this and this and this. They, they come to us and say, I'd like to designate my property as a heritage property. It's, it, it's not me, it's the bylaw. We craft the bylaw the way that we want to, we want it. So yes, it would be voluntary. Um, businesses, though, the way that it's set up in West Hans, I mean, you can read it. I, I, I read it. You can read it. Um, this is not my bylaw. This is a bylaw to protect its, the heritage buildings in the town of Kentville. So it's not 100% voluntary. I. I guess it's 100% voluntary if the, if the council wants it 100% voluntary. Yes. All right. Council, uh, De Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Um, so, like, in terms of the, uh, I, I just, in terms of the who enforces it, who vets it, um, so, to Director Gentleman's point, you have a bylaw. It is, is it then, is it back to staff that vets it and, and enforces it? it? Is that sort of the idea? That's yes. just mm -hmm. Yeah, the, generally there will be a um, heritage officer designated under the bylaw. A heritage officer. Yeah. Okay. Well, basically, and it tends to be the planning staff. So when, when, a, when a permit comes in for a, a, a building that's designated, mm -hmm. They have to review that against the heritage bylaw to make sure it's in compliance with the bylaw. Okay. So they can't do anything until that letter of compliance is provided to the applicant okay. if they come in or some an applicant for a building permit. And then a DP and a building permit can be issued as well. So there's two steps now mm -hmm. that will come 
become involved and anybody wants to do anything to their home in terms of renovations or anything else, there's that step of compliance, a letter of compliance as laid out in the MGA or the, um, the uh, Heritage Property Act, that mm -hmm. that is a requirement. Okay. Okay, thank you. CEO, please. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I think just to um, just from a from a, a kind of walking through process here. So um, we're we're going to talk about here that um, a bylaw that we're really putting together is kind of the the straw dog because we do need to get a better understanding. And I think Director Gentleman's done a great job of articulating that there are folks out there who are experts in kind of what is heritage, not heritage. I even think that the, 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 the comments here from Councillor York around we, we, from an inclusivity perspective, have to even look well beyond um, what we see as a lens as, as, as European or Acadian mm -hmm. ancestry coming mm -hmm. and, and when we're looking at what we're designating. So, um, you know, this, this will be a bit of a process uh, to, to get to a place where then you're going to effectively have a mechanism to determine if, if something would be eligible or not. Then again, um, uh, someone applies, you go through this process and, and you come out with a piece. So there's a bit of a work to establish broadly what we're trying to do, a bit of work around what is included, how you score it, and then who reviews it. Um, and so um, I think just to kind of go one step, so picture uh, someone comes forward and applies. <coughs> So uh, there is an application piece that would go through planning and there is a piece that would likely for anything that's a substantive alteration or a change will go to a committee for that committee to review that um, because then they start weighing does it meet whatever litmus test we put in place. Mm -hmm. So the bylaw is a piece of a broader process and, and those parameters would be a piece we'd bring back first to make sure that we're capturing what the intent of what council would like to see, but then we're going to have to engage some folks who know this stuff more inside out than, than um, I, I, I think to capture the sense of what we consider is, is heritage type things and how we would score that going forward. I probably didn't do a great job of articulating that, but uh, it's, this will be a bit of a process to get to where the end game needs to be on this. Uh, the, the rough, um, the rough bylaw still will need some nuggets from some expertise if we're going to do it right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CAO. Are there any further comments with uh, Councillor Maxwell? Yeah, I just want to make, <clears throat> make sure that we're thinking about buildings and we're not thinking about private residences. All right? That, that's the distinction here. Like, we're not talking about a private residence. We're talking about a building that a business probably operating out of. Okay? That's... Councillor Maxwell, I'm, 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 I'm going to move out of, out of order, I guess, uh, is probably the best way. But I'm not seeing what you've said that the West Hants, and, and I've... I, I read it and then I went back looking for your statement with regards to the fact that the municipality can designate um, a business. If you could point that out, I would, I would be most grateful for that. It's under registry, 2.1, the municipality shall establish and retain the business registry of heritage property. Mm -hmm. Well, it also describes documents related to the registration is there and then it says what it would contain. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that the 4.0, the municipality shall cause the notice of recommendation to be served upon each registered owner of the building, mm -hmm. public building, interior street state, or whatever, um, at least 30 days prior to registration of the building. And um, But that's after they apply for it. They have to apply it for it, and then this is... Yeah, yeah I, I think that goes back to the point of... Um, having this as a voluntary, right. a voluntary I application. This is not entirely voluntary. They have a heritage committee that says these are the buildings that we think uh, in West Ham should be maintained or should be protected. 
Then they go over to the, the building owners and they say, um, we're making up a municipal registry of heritage property and uh, we're going to put your building on the registry. And then there's a process um, that they can come back and say, But nowhere does it say that the municipality has the right. The registry part is that the municipality shall establish and maintain a registry. And then it goes on that registrants and what they have to do. So it's, it, it is a voluntary. There's, there is no way West Hands can go out and say this building is, uh, is, is heritage. Uh, may, solicitor, may I, I know you're standing up. I don't, I don't see where that, where your interpretation so, so I think everybody's forgetting that the Act overrides the bylaws, mm -hmm. and everything that's been quoted from this bylaw comes straight out of the Act. Um, so it sounds to me like this bylaw, um, for the most part, is just repeating the Act in many respects. Um, the, uh, the purpose of the Act, as has been said many times, is really about identifying properties, if we're talking about buildings, identifying buildings where you want to preserve character-defining elements of a property. Because what the Act does is it prevents an owner of a municipally registered property from making a substantial alteration. And substantial alteration is defined in the Act as any action that affects or alters the character-defining elements of a property. So ultimately, what your Heritage Committee is going to have to do, or somebody's going to have to do, is determine what the character defining elements of a property are. And that may be, uh, as was mentioned earlier by the CAO, a specific type of property that exists in town, or it may be individual properties, and identifying those character defining elements for each one that you register. And um, the, uh, uh, it's correct that you can write the bylaw as you wish, but I would suggest to you that um, if you're going to have a heritage bylaw for the purposes of preserving a certain type of built heritage, that you're probably not going to limit it by the type of use that's in the property. If the intent is to, is to preserve built heritage, you're going to identify the types of built heritage that are important to preserve, and you're going to try to preserve them. Right? And you're going to go out to those property owners, and you're going to say, Here's your notice. We're good. Council's going to consider your property. And now, as a result of them having that notice, they can't do anything to change. They can't make a substantial alteration during the consideration time, which is 120 days. So they will be prevented in that period of time that it's being considered for making changes. As a, and they have the opportunity, as you heard, that this is in the act, to come before a council and say why they shouldn't be registered. And council ultimately makes the decision about whether or not this property will be registered. Once it is, then it has to follow the rules. No substantial alterations. Totally depends on what's important about that building, what that means. So each registration has to be very particular. I'm familiar with one in Port Williams, for example, um, that uh, is on Middle Street in Port Williams. Yes, Middle Street. And, uh, uh, and I have no doubt that the only reason that got registered was because of the assistance and financing in restoring that particular home. And it's a single family home. And uh, uh, I don't think the current own, I don't think the folks that renovated it currently live there. Um, the, uh, uh, but it enabled them, right? The, this process is typically, in my experience as a lawyer, um, uh, people come forward asking to be registered because they want to preserve built heritage and there are tax incentives for doing so. Um, so there is that benefit to it. But there is also the other side where there may be property owners who 
don't want to preserve the built heritage that you as a council consider to be important to the town, and in those situations, it's being imposed upon. So, for example, if you said, we don't want the facade of the Cornwallis Inn to have vinyl siding, right, your heritage bylaw could prevent that. Without a heritage bylaw, if they want to put vinyl siding on the side of the Cornwallis Inn, they can. It's their building, they can do, they can do with it as they wish. Um, the, uh, uh, whether that would ever make sense to do, I leave to you. Um, the, uh, uh, but that's the sort of thing that you would likely be faced with, I would suggest, would be those who want to be registered because of whatever perceived benefit they see from it, and those that you would want to register because the built heritage, built heritage is important to you. Um, the ones that I've seen there is clearly a fair bit of work invested in each property. And so you hope you've got interested volunteers on a committee that are prepared to, to dedicate that time. But ultimately, it's written up in a form that it gets recorded at the Registry of Deeds. This is very official. And it needs to be written in a way that's enforceable because a subsequent owner needs to understand what they're getting into. Okay. So I just want to emphasize the legal nature of this, right? Um, and, uh, but it emphasizes the importance of preserving and making the decisions around the preserving of whatever the built heritage is that you're, that you're turning your attention to. I know Councillor Gerard had a question earlier, and I don't have a clue what it was anymore. And maybe he doesn't either. Yeah, I'm not no, sure. I just I wanted to make sure that it was voluntary, obviously. It doesn't have to be. So you own a building that's 200 years old, the town has gone and said, you know what, we're designating this, and you say, you know what, I don't want to own this building anymore, uh, I'm going to sell it, and you have five people come up and they go, I don't, I don't like the designation you've got, so you're asking X number of dollars, uh, I'm going to have to spend a lot of money on it or I can't do anything to it. Uh, this is what I'll give you. So is there a liability on the town? There's, there's no liability on the town. The, uh, uh, these sorts of designations are uh, very site-specific, but you can start as broad as land use bylaws and then go down to uh, heritage bylaws, right, that put restrictions on properties. As you heard from Director Gentleman, it could cause insurance problems, depending on the nature of the restrictions, right? And those, those are, re are very real issues that property owners need to consider um, when they are thinking about should we be registered as a heritage property. Um, the, uh, uh, now, having said that, right, we see all kinds of developments in larger areas where they incorporate facades in new buildings. That's about preserving the facade, right? Everything behind that facade is brand new. Um, the, uh, uh, but, so there's various aspects of that. Um, and uh, usually this comes up in the context of heritage under threat, right? Built heritage under threat. And if you feel you have built heritage under threat, then this is the way you address it. Thank you, Solicitor. Councillor Zabian. Thank you. Um, I know we're in a motion, but could we not reach out to West Hans and just get an update on how they've, they've run this for the last couple of years and what, you know, progress they've had and, and any negative or positive, you know, that to me would be logical and, you know, they've obviously got a bigger um, area than we do, but I mean, obviously, I think it, I just was skimming this again, they looked at it again last year, I guess, in 2021, they did an update or something in there I was looking, so that would be nice to look at and then I guess go from there and see what, you know, thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Are you ready for the question? The question is on adoption of the motion for CAC to direct the CAO to pursue drafting a heritage bylaw for review by council. I probably should have asked the CAO if you have enough information to start the straw dog to bring something back to us. Um, I would say that I would be bringing this back with 
um, a number of decision points for council to make and particularly so it'll be decision a and it's kind of like one of those books you know you do a now you're going to drop down to c uh, that might be how this is going to work our way through it so people can make decisions around each component all right thank you uh, thank you for that uh, cao uh, so i'll go oh uh, deputy mayor thank you worship just so i'm clear it just means you're bringing something back with with a series of options okay is that yeah, correct correct and i'm well, going to also say that just for greater clarity this is going to take a bit of time oh yes i would yes okay. I would think. <laughs> yeah okay yeah, so i have so called it a drafting uh, heritage bylaw because that was the the wording in the rfd um staff could come back to us and say we don't think it should be a bylaw we think it should be x so, but this is the decision that Councillor Mas Maxwell has requested of us. So we'll pursue it in, in that manner. Uh, Director, a uh, gentleman, you, uh, you wanted to say something? Well, no, I think now that we have a better, a clearer pathway as to where we're going forward, but just a couple of thoughts that came as I was sitting down was, if we're not looking at private properties or private homes, it, it sounds like it's more of like a downtown kind of thing. I think then we need to get the uh, KBC involved and how do we mesh the facade program that we have right now with what might come out of a heritage bylaw. Mm -hmm. So they could be completely different beasts altogether. One could be providing an incentive for one thing for newer, you know, yeah. Just those kinds of things that really need to be taken into consideration. And again, the idea of what it is that we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Um, just wondering perhaps if, uh, if staff could also look at the grants that are available. I believe there's a federal grant for um, improving buildings, heritage buildings, and maybe uh, provincial grants as well. And so if you're doing a renovation on a building, a heritage designated building, you may be eligible for, for specific grants and money. So they could look at that. That would be helpful. Yeah. If I, I'll just comment on what I've gathered from that so far. If it's a municipally uh, registered building, there, it's the rebate for the GST, that's it. Unless the municipality, the town wants to provide funding similar to the facade program for folks to come in as long as they meet the criteria and what they're trying to do isn't a substantial change, then there's monies available through the town through grants to be able to those kinds of things but you, you can't get provincial money or federal money for a municipal heritage building. Thank you, uh, thank you for that, Director. Um, so are we ready for the question? The question is on adoption of the motion for CAC to direct the CAO to pursue drafting a heritage bylaw for review by council. Voting is now open. Voting is now closed, and the motion is carried. Thank you. Could we do just a quick file? Sure. Bylaw, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll just uh, shut off uh, recording. Uh,
All right, thank you. All right, our next uh, item under our new business request for decision is with regards to a youth committee. Um, Councillor York, you have uh, brought this forward. Uh, if you would like to speak to it. Thank you. Um, so council have in front of them um, just uh, background information. Um, I will do my best to explain as we go through. Um, but one of, the, um, one of the notes that we heard from our public engagement session was that there is a need for youth engagement and then also um, youth involvement in, in areas around town. So what I am proposing or what I am requesting is that council establish a youth council, which would be a committee of council that reports directly to council, um, specifically on the needs and wants of, of youth in our community. So the town of Kentville in the 90s had a youth council. Um, it worked on several initiatives, but was disbanded at some point in the sort of mid to late 90s, uh, and it hasn't been back since. So um, as governments across Canada, um, from federal down to municipal, make decisions that create uh, generational impacts, we are not consulting the people who will bear the consequences of those decisions the most in the future. So um, by creating a youth council, we'll have an opportunity to act on both the historical need that Kentville has identified as, as um, being there, needing a youth council, and then the recent, or uh, sorry, the recently identified wants of the community to have youth be more engaged. So what, what do we get from a youth council? Why do we have a youth council? And, and giving youth a dedicated platform and presence in town allows them to um, create an opportunity for their voices to be heard and enable them to make the changes that they want to see while engaging more youth in the process. So by creating a youth council, one of the mandates, though certainly not um, the only mandate, could be that youth create and host more youth engagement opportunities for the other youth in the community. One of the things that we're lacking in our decision making, I believe, is that um, we don't have, or sorry, as a gap in our knowledge, is that we do not have the youth voice here at the table. And so by inviting them to their own table, they can let us know what their needs and wants are. And it will give us a better and more complete picture of what uh, the needs are in, in, in the town. And by providing an opportunity for youth to um, influence the government and change their community for the better, I think the entire town will benefit from that. When surveyed, youth um, identify youth engagement, climate change and environmental justice, youth employment, substance use and mental health, equity, equality and discrimination, transportation and access to quality education as their chief concerns um, in, in Canada at the moment. So while most of those do have some municipal um, connection, they, they could be more thoroughly explored with a youth council giving direction and giving insight into those issues. Um, so my proposal would be a youth council that mirrors our town council with seven total members from grades eight through 12, and they would all be voting members, and the term and the, the mandates would be determined by the youth council themselves. I would recommend that one town councilor sit on that committee, but it would be a non-voting member and be there to serve as a source of information and governance and guidance as they, as they get their feet underneath them. I would also propose that the mayor or deputy mayor um, also attend the meetings, but also be a non-voting member and to serve as, again, a source of information and, and um, guidance. And while there would be most definitely budget and policy impacts, we don't exactly know what the extent of those would be at the moment because the council does not exist and so they have not yet made their mandate, so we don't know yet what that would be, but I would suspect that there would be obviously policy impacts from that. So that's just a very brief overview, um, but it was, it stemmed out of the conversations that we had at the public hearing, uh, or sorry, at the public uh, meeting where people brought forward their concerns, but also their, their, um, enjoyment of and seeing and celebrating youth and in our community and the wonderful things that are happening right now and all of the, the ways that youth are really um, stepping up to the plate and, and really excelling in what they do. I think it's time that we hear from them in a more formal capacity and then also take into consideration that we are making rules and regulations that are going to most definitely impact them the most and they don't really have a say in how that, how that transpires. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor York. So based on what you have said here, and uh, as it is a request for decision, 
um, it will go to uh, to the CAO and uh, and staff to uh, to have a, a look at it. Uh, CAO, did uh, did you want us to formalize this with uh, a motion to the floor, or um, did you have enough information here to get something started, and as you would say, bring a straw dog back to us? Uh, Mayor Snow, I, I think I think the latter. I think we're in a position where um, we collect this information, bring it back, and if we're heading down the right path and then we can get specific direction from council or committee or council at that time. Excellent. Uh, Councillor York, does this meet the requirements of your request for decision? 100%, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. All right, moving right along, our next request for decision is uh, planning for sustainability advisory committee and uh, uh, CAO, if, uh, if you would uh, update uh, council on, uh, on the RFD. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, thank you, Mayor Snow. Um, while this um, document is coming forward um, and, and pen to paper was put together by the mayor, I know that several councillors around the table uh, expressed interest in this idea of a, of a planning advisory committee, both when we talked about the things that we saw strategically as important, but also as we were moving into our session with the public forum. And uh, the two areas in particular uh, that I guess uh, would be worth um, outlining is that first under the MGA um, municipal units have the ability to to structure planning advisory committee but we're basically um, kind of at that crossroads particularly on the issue of, of housing and this is not just a Kenville issue this is uh, a province-wide and, and even one would say a countrywide issue and so as Kenville is poised to um, go through uh, potential and, and likely sizable growth um, there's also with that going to come the, the requirement to have consistent economic growth, uh, to be looking at sustainability, and then one of the pieces, and you probably hear Director Bedingfield talk about this quite a bit when she does presentations, but the idea of resilience. So what do you do when you have a shock in your community? And, you know, a lot of the bigger cities actually um, not just look at it from a housing and a food perspective, but even, you know, get into social services and transportation. So this is kind of one of those um, pieces where um, this document talks a little bit about a committee that would be put together um, to consider things like our active transportation plan or accessibility plan when making um, decisions. And, and as Kenful has experienced this uh, growth and recognizing that there are some challenges, particularly in the area of housing, what is this going to mean for our future? So as ideas begin to percolate, um, whether we have development uh, coming forward or early stages of community wanting to see things happen, having essentially a, a committee that would look at these lenses, ask a number of questions, get some information, and supply advice directly to council as the corresponding planning permits and whatnot come through. So if you think about right now our, our MPS and our, our, our land use bylaw are the foundation on the development side of where we are, this committee can look at things like, okay, in connection with or in tandem with that, how are we going to support our growth? What advice and recommendations are coming uh, to council from planning and from the idea of resilience in the community kind of at the same time? It gives council the ability to do um, information gathering in places where maybe it's broader than just talking about planning, maybe just looking for information around as population begins to grow, what are some of the strains that are even bigger than the work we're doing today. Um, and so it helps with planning, it helps to give a form for um, information to be received from. As I mentioned, um, really the, the, the Town of Kenful Accessibility Plan, the Active Transportation Plan, our Asset Management Plan are lenses that the committee would, would use, but also looking at economic growth tax base and, and what are we doing to enhance the life of, of, of citizens. Today, um, you know, we have developers that are coming forward to the town. We have citizens who are talking about out of the box solutions to things. Mm -hmm. And so um, what if these were things that we wanted to explore and see how they're gonna move forward? And you know, if you had um, a committee and what was potentially put forward here is you have 
three members of council, three members of the public, um, the mayor ex officio, maybe you have a developer ex officio, the province, CMHC, these are all folks who are involved in not just uh, building housing, but economically making sure that good things are happening and you're, you're thinking about your growth in a way that sometimes is bigger than just is it a yes or a no from a planning perspective. Maybe it needs more work to get to yes, and this is some advice that you can receive that more work from. So um, essentially, this is about a planning advisory committee plus um, with thinking about things like resilience um, and specifically looking at, um, I know I, I touched heavily on the housing piece, but also things about you know your land capacity, um, things like your um, urban forest and, and tree planning and so on. So there used to be the kinds of things that give you another sounding board and build upon the work already that our MPS and LUB bring forward. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts and would be similar to the other RFDs, um, I would say would come back with a report to, to council to flush it out further. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Your Worship, and thanks, CEO Troke. I think it's a great idea. Um, um, I, I think it's a wonderful idea, actually, and I know, uh, you know we've had some conversations around this over the last year or so, so I think it makes, I think it makes good sense. Um, would, would this committee be under the sole purview of, of the planning department? Um, that's sort of one one piece, and then when we talk about development agreements, um, obviously this committee would be sort of an advisory to planning. That was that was another piece, um, and then uh, this is probably more for Mayor Snow. Is the the one CMHC representative? Is are there local CMHC reps? Yeah. Okay. That that could sit on this committee. Okay. Yeah. Those are a few couple things, sorry, thanks. Not I sorry, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that um, typically um, a, plan, a typical planning advisory committee in Nova Scotia is one that kind of works in connection with your, your planning mm -hmm. to, to bring information to council. And I think in this case, um, this is is taking it a little bit even farther into talking about more economic development and overall resilience yeah. um, based upon some of the conversation that council's already had here it's quite possible that this town could double in size very rapidly and so with that um, it's not just about um, you know planning it's about um, key investments it's about uh, partnerships and it's about um, things that might not even be on our planning horizon mm -hmm. today when you think about smaller tinier more efficient type things that as even different government programs roll out how can we be connecting the players together so um, to 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 all of those pieces it would be advice um, for council to really kind of um, ask whatever questions it kind of needed and have one more lens in addition to um, obviously director gentleman and her team will do what they always do with regards to our work um, in, in giving us what is what is permissible under our land use bylaws well I think even since you know being elected in 2016 and there's a few of us around here um, we've been saying every year we're on the cusp we're on the cusp but it we keep being on the cusp because we keep expanding, right? And it and it's and it's going to continue. And I think uh, a committee like this would is imperative going forward. So, thank you, Councillor Maxwell. Thank you, CAO, for for this report. Um, I like the general um, gist of this committee, but I do have um, a couple of concerns, especially when you include the active transportation plan and the accessibility plan. Um, we have. Um, an inclusion and access um, committee and there are very specialized people on that committee and uh, well equipped to speak to 
um, both of those plans and um, to have a group such as this come in and then start to make recommendations I think is a duplication of, of, uh, of, of uh, ideas and so on unless we're planning to get rid of those and then I would suggest that we have people on that committee that, uh, that uh, really know what they're talking about when it comes to active transportation and uh, inclusion and access. Um, I don't see those as part of a planning advisory committee. Um, I, I think those are recreation and uh, you need uh, qualifications to deal with those types of issues. And so I don't, I, I really have, um, I'm very leery about including things like that in, in this committee. Thank you. I would say that um, there is um, one of the uh, one of the pieces in the document, and I probably didn't do it justice, but um, one of the guiding principles would be that the Town of Kentville Accessibility Plan would be considered as, as part of development. And I think you're right, Councillor Maxwell, that how do you marry marry those that expertise and that perspective up would be an important component of that. Um, and so uh, I think we'd want to make sure that we connect all of the, the relevant expertise to however we would make that work. So question, um, are we planning to um, get rid of the uh, inclusion and access committee and, and so on and, and replace it with this type, with this committee? Um, how do you see that working when you have two groups advising on the exact same things? Um, I, so first, I, this, is, this is meant not to exclude or take away any other committees. Uh, to be to be clear, my my expectation is is that the, the accessibility committee and and our uh, other committees have been given a very high priority. This is intended to be more of a specific uh, tool in the toolbox for council when it comes to receiving some some advice. And in fact, it might be that this group may be working very closely with the accessibility committee to get advice from the accessibility committee on, on how do they move forward. Um, but I do not see, and I guess ultimately that's council's decision, but I don't think this is intended to be a replacement for, this is intended to be um, another opportunity for council to, as they receive uh, different things that are coming forward, to receive advice from and perspectives from from folks and not intended to be ruling one out. I don't think that's what, certainly I know anything that I'd be bringing back on it, that would not be what I'd be bringing back as a recommendation. Okay, thank you. All right, so CAO, uh, you have enough information to uh, take it back to staff and bring something back to council? Sure do, we're gonna All be right. busy. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, our next uh, matter is uh, the Highgate uh, Plow Report, and Director Bell, you've uh, you've hung out with us tonight uh, to give us uh, give us this report and make sure our thermostat was uh, was set uh, on the right setting. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Snow. Uh, good evening again, folks. Um, I guess I will read through a lot of this because uh, it's it's already a brief in a sense. So I don't want to miss some of the highlights. Um, our request was made to investigate the feasibility uh, of the Town of Kenfield Public Works Department purchasing and using snow gates. They're also known as high gates or end gates by various manufacturers uh, to temporarily interrupt and carry the snow across driveways and intersections, lessening the ridge or windrow of snow left behind. Uh, the snow gate concept in one form or another has been around for, for decades. Uh, it's a hydraulically controlled attachment uh, that's added to the end of a, of a snow blade on a loader or grader, typically, and is meant to temporarily interrupt and carry the snow, as I mentioned before. The town of Canfield only owns um, one loader and does not own or lease uh, a grader. An estimated 75% of, of the town's streets are cleared uh, with plow or salt trucks on which snow gates are incompatible. If snow gates are to be considered, uh, the town would need to purchase or lease additional loaders and or graders. Uh, but that equipment cannot simultaneously spread salt like our plow trucks can. After researching uh, the use of snow gates in the Atlantic provinces, I have only found one town uh, that uses them, or Maktou, New Brunswick. Um, their supervisor of roads and grounds 
um, Scott Brewer said, uh, the gates aren't effective after more than five centimeters or two inches of snow falls or if a driveway is wide. The snow will spill out over the top inside, of, <clears throat> inside if there's too much. That's his quote. Um, the other, another uh, community, uh, actually up in Ontario, but the city of Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, investigated the use of snow gates uh, prior to the winter of 21-22 and originally liked the idea but realized in an urban setting um, with driveways close together, uh, the first couple driveways fare out quite well, but uh, by the time you are 10 plus houses down the road, that homeowner is going to end up with an even larger pile of snow in their driveway and higher banks along the length of their property. In a rural area um, where you could be 500 to 1,000 feet from driveway to driveway, it would work. Uh, but we don't have issues, this is again their quote, uh, we don't have issues in our rural areas because those ditched, they're ditched rather, and can be, and the, uh, the snow can be put in the ditches. Those are the reasons we haven't entered, entertained the gate. The other issue is the narrowing of roads. Um, this past winter especially we had uh, some very narrow streets, especially in subdivisions with each, each subsequent snowfall, um, and that would be, be a, an even greater issue with the use of a snow gate. Um, the next and most, I guess, greatest concern that Public Works Department has in utilizing snow gates is the time required to remove snow and maintain clear roads during a snow event. Communities that have, um, that have used snow gates report a two to three time increase um, in the time required to clear the roads. If this is accurate, and even if you use a two times factor, um, then two things would be, need to be considered. Uh, you could, first, you could live with a 50% slower clearing time frame, um, I used uh, snow cleared within 12 hours of a snow event would need, would then need roughly 24 hours or hire additional seasonal staff to increase the winter snow crew complement from our current nine to up to nine to 18 employees if it was a true two to one um, ratio. If this timeline doubles, uh, the other concern is access to properties through the town streets by first responders like fire, police and ambulance. Um, the budget implication, well, the capital cost of the snow gate uh, isn't high, approximately $15,000 a piece, but the larger issue uh, is additional equipment would need to be uh, required to be purchased or at least to put the, put the snow gates on, graders or loaders, at approximately $350,000 a piece if we purchase them or, or lease them seasonally if that was an option. Um, each, as well as additional staff to run them, and of course the ever-increasing cost of diesel fuel. Um, I've included an attachment, a picture just of a typical uh, loader uh, that shows, shows that uh, end gate or snow gate, high gate, um, on the end of the, uh, of the loader blade. And I guess this would be the time to see if there's any questions before, before a recommendation. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Director Bell. Are there any questions uh, for the Director with regards uh, to the report? Okay, you've got a recommendation. I do, uh, that based on the above research and findings that the town of Kentville should not use snow gates as part of our snow and ice control plan. All right, thank you very much for that recommendation. Uh, Councillor Zabian, you brought this uh, request for decision uh, forward. Did you have anything that you wish to, to add? No, I think you explained it well. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. So based on, uh, on the recommendation of staff, uh, this matter um, is uh, is considered uh, is considered closed as this was an RF an RFD. All right, uh, our next item uh, on the agenda is a pace update. Uh, CEO Troke, if you could uh, take us through that, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Snow. Um, so uh, we had a presentation previously from uh, Julian Boyles with Pace, and um, basically we've been contacted to continue the, the conversation to see if the town of Kenville is interested in the next uh, offering that would be uh, moving forward. Uh, so I'm gonna be meeting with uh, Julian next week. Um, in addition, uh, what we've done is I certainly have had conversations with the town of Wolfville around their experience. And um, many folks would be familiar with Omar who is with Quest and Omar has um, uh, offered to meet to also discuss the experience the Quest has seen uh, with regards to offerings um, here in Nova Scotia, but also some feedback they've had 
from some other jurisdictions. So I just wanted to let um, council know that uh, once those conversations are done, I'll be bringing back uh, a, a fuller uh, detailed report on if council is looking to move forward on it, what the timing would look like and so on. Um, I do know that uh, PACE is looking to secure municipal units here in, in Atlantic Canada who would be moving forward, uh, likely it'd be this summer. So I will be coming back to uh, council with uh, information on that as, as quick as I can uh, finish that up. So um, uh, Julian is away this week. I'll be meeting with him next week, Omar as well, and, and passing along the information to council to make some decisions on if they're interested in proceeding or not and what the implications of that would be. Thank you, uh, CAO. And I see we have a question from Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Worship. CAO Troke, do we know, um, I'm assuming that funding is still available through FCM and those sorts of things are not running out or anything like that? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I, I don't know about running out. I know that um, the, you know, Atlantic Canada has really taken full advantage mm. of this over yeah. the last offerings. And so I think you're going to see more municipal units in, in, in are getting interested. So um, at this point in time, what they would be looking at is kind of that Atlantic Canada package moving forward. And um, I think they're looking at those who have not been involved previously to spend as much time answering whatever questions mm. they need so decisions can get made. Uh, but then once this offering does go out the door, they are sensing that it's going to be utilized relatively quick. So Absolutely. this could be one of those kind of, if you're going to go, this could be one of those last mm. kind of kick at the cans if you're going to do it. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions with regards uh, to PACE? So CA CAO, uh, we expect to see a report back and perhaps uh, a decision on our part whether to proceed? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So our next uh, item is uh, is public comments. Uh, there's uh, nobody here, so no comments. Um, we do have uh, a land and a personnel matter, which must be conducted in a closed session. And we require a motion to go into closed session to discuss the agenda items. We will not be returning to Facebook Live for adjournment of this meeting. So if we could move into a closed session to discuss the items, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and Councillor York. I saw the hands over there. It's been moved and seconded that Council move into a closed session. The question is on adoption of the motion to move into a closed session. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. And the time is uh, 9.08.